right so a very good evening everyone yes i welcome you all to this particular final rapid revision of the general medicine <clears throat> so what is that i'll be discussing in this session is i'll be discussing four topics today one is the endocrinology then nephrology cardiology and as well as the connective tissue disorders so these four topics i'll be doing the quick revision for today and tomorrow same time neurology pulmonology git and as well as the previous year questions so and the return the return uh, annotations will be available on my channel that is medicine made easy by dr rajesh gubba right so let us start with the today's session so the session uh, is slightly like one one hour i will take for each system that is endocrinology one hour nephrology one hour cardiology one hour and connective tissue disorders one hour okay so in that way we'll try to progress in the today's session and if you have any doubts you can just put your doubt in the chat box where i'll definitely answer your questions okay so the first topic is right the first topic is the diabetes insipidus so if you take the diabetes insipidus yeah uh, prajapati one one hour for each system endocrinology one hour cardiology one hour nephrology one hour and connective tissue disorders one hour okay right yes yes uh, gopalan i'll be covering all the theory part as well right starting with the first topic that is diabetes insipidus so diabetes insipidus like what exactly this mean it is the disorder which is characterized by polyuria and as well as the polydipsia right polyuria and as well as polydipsia and when we are using the word polyuria like what should be the quantity of the urine output it will be more than 3 liters per 24 hours right it should be more than 3 liters per 24 hours right or like when we are using the word polyuria it should be more than 40 to 50 ml per kg per hour that is also the polyuria 40 to 50 ml per kg per hour and when we are using the word central diabetes insipidus central diabetes insipidus means where there is complete deficiency of anti diuretic hormone right this particular pdf with annotations will be available on my telegram channel that is medicine made easy by dr rajesh gubba and yes english also i'll try to teach now then if you take nephrogenic diabetes insipidus nephrogenic diabetes insipidus mein problem kya hoga so in this the adh will be present in adequate quantities but there will be adh receptor resistance hoga right there will be adh receptor resistance will be there in case of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus then uske baad aapka etiology like if you take the etiology of the central diabetes insipidus one of the very very important etiology for central diabetes insipidus will be the head injury right head injury will be one of the very important etiology then followed by that you need to know the tumors like cranio pharyngioma can cause central diabetes insipidus uske baad hoga infections like chronic meningitis and viral encephalitis these are also the one which will be responsible for the central diabetes insipidus then uske baad hoga nephrogenic diabetes insipidus nephrogenic diabetes mein uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus mein important thing what they'll ask you is about the drugs which will be causing nephrogenic diabetes insipidus right the drugs which are causing nephrogenic diabetes insipidus will be mainly lithium then we have amphotericin b then demiclocycline right then another important drug very very important drug that includes your amino glycosides which are active against gram negative infections then what is your didmot syndrome didmot syndrome is responsible for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus iska dusra naam hai ki ulfram syndrome the another name for this didmot syndrome is the ulfram syndrome the type of inheritance for didmot syndrome is autosomal recessive type of inheritance and what are the components of didmot the word di stands for 
right the word di stands for diabetes insipidus the word dm stands for diabetes mellitus the word oa stands for optic atrophy and the last word d stands for deafness okay so didmot syndrome which is also called wolfram syndrome that is also an autosomal recessive condition which will cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus then investigations agar aap dekhe to serum osmolality kya hoga diabetes insipidus patients mein serum osmolality bad jayega fir urine osmolality kya hoga kam ho jayega kyun because polyuria is there and serum sodium will be elevated in patients with the diabetes insipidus then what is the investigation of choice in patients with diabetes insipidus the investigation of choice will be the water deprivation test okay water deprivation test will be the investigation of choice in patients with diabetes insipidus which will help you to differentiate central and as well as nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and it will also differentiate it from psychogenic polydipsia as well then uske baad hoga drug of choice kya hai central diabetes insipidus mein right drug of choice in central diabetes insipidus kya hoga that will be desmopressin right desmopressin is considered as the drug of choice and desmopressin it can be given oral subcutaneous inhalational and as well as intravenous route as well then what is the drug of choice for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus the drug of choice will be the thiazide diuretics and one more important point is lithium induced diabetes insipidus in lithium induced diabetes insipidus what is the drug of choice in lithium induced diabetes insipidus the drug of choice will be amiloride right drug of choice will be amiloride so that is about your diabetes insipidus in crisp manner then you answer this question a 33 year old lady presented with polydipsia and as well as polyuria her symptom started soon after a road traffic accident 6 months ago the blood pressure is 120 by 80 mm of mercury with no postural drop daily urine output is almost 6 to 8 liters and investigations showed sodium 130 potassium 3.5 urea 15 sugar 65 plasma osmolality 268 urine osmolality 45 so what do you think is the most likely diagnosis in this clinical scenario any one of you right so the most likely diagnosis in this clinical scenario right no 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 my dear students it is not diabetes insipidus it is your psychogenic polydipsia now why is it psychogenic polydipsia why because if you take the urine osmolality it is reduced plasma osmolality even that is also reduced so where will you have both urine and plasma osmolality being reduced that is in case of psychogenic polydipsia hum diabetes insipidus mein kya pada hai hum like we have discussed that serum osmolality bad jayega diabetes insipidus mein fir urine osmolality kya hoga urine osmolality kam ho jayega so that is what we have learned but our question says both are reduced so it is not your diabetes insipidus fir isme kya hoga that may be psychogenic polydipsia right then uske baad like a quick discussion on saadh a adh deficiency ho gaya that is your diabetes insipidus uske baad like let me discuss about the saadh syndrome of inappropriate anti diuretic hormone where there is excessive right where there will be excessive production of the anti diuretic hormone yeah nidhi kumari and as well as abdullah the normal serum osmolality hmm, normal serum osmolality will be 285 to 295 and normal urine osmolality kya hoga normal urine osmolality will be around 300 to 1000 milli osmoles theek hai right now the question is which is the most common type of bronchogenic carcinoma that will be responsible for your saadh most common bronchogenic carcinoma most common bronchogenic carcinoma most common bronchogenic carcinoma will be oat cell carcinoma right which is also nothing but small cell carcinoma of the lung theek hai right then then the next is the saadh okay the drugs causing saadh what are the drugs which will be causing saadh are mainly the immunosuppressant drugs and what are those immunosuppressant drugs that includes vincristin okay so we have the vinca alkaloids that is vincristin uske baad ho gaya aapka desmopressin can also cause the saadh 
and we have one important drug which is a first generation sulfonyl urea that is nothing but your chlorpropamide chlorpropamide can also cause the SAADH okay now you take the clinical features of SAADH so what you have to understand that is in SAADH because of compensatory mechanisms there will be development of hyponatremia so all the clinical features are because of the hyponatremia what will be that altered sensorium hoga seizures develop hoga headache projectile vomiting coma and finally death so SAADH may clinical features kis wajay se hoga hyponatremia ke wajay se clinical features develop hoga then uske baad serum osmolality serum osmolality SAADH patients mein kya ho jayega right the serum osmolality will be reduced kam ho jayega phir urine osmolality kya hoga patients mein in SAADH patients mein in SAADH patients urine osmolality bad jayega right so what will happen to serum sodium the serum sodium kam ho jayega kyun because of compensatory mechanisms ras inhibit hoga aur एट्रियल नेट्रियोरिटिक फैक्टर रिलीज होगा उस वजह से सोडियम पूरा बाहर चले जाएगा द सोडियम विल बी कंप्लीटली आउट सो यूरिन सोडियम विल बी इंक्रीज सो प्लीज रिमेंबर द सीरम सोडियम डिक्रीजेस यूरिन सोडियम इंक्रीजेस राइट इन्वेस्टिगेशन ऑफ चॉइस क्या है एस एडीएच पेशेंट्स में एस एडीएच पेशेंट्स में इन्वेस्टिगेशन ऑफ चॉइस विल बी द वाटर लोडिंग टेस्ट राइट इट विल बी Water loading test that will be the investigation of choice. ठीक है? Then what is the drug of choice for SADH? Drug of choice क्या होगा? Drug of choice is the Vaptans. Right? Drug of choice is Vaptans. ठीक है? So what are these Vaptans? That is vasopressin receptor antagonist. And these Vaptans they include tolvaptan. And this tolvaptan it is taken through oral route. Right? Tolvaptan kaise lega? Through oral route. And we have another drug that is Conivaptan. So Conivaptan that is through the intravenous route. And what are the other measures in the treatment that we do in SADH patients? Pani kam lena hai. The water intake should be reduced. And agar symptomatic hyponatremia hai patients ko. If the patient is having symptomatic hyponatremia, then you should also give 3% sodium chloride. Right, you should also give 3% sodium chloride. So this is about the quick recap of SAADH. Most common type of bronchogenic carcinoma causing SAADH. That will be your small cell carcinoma. Right? That is most common bronchogenic carcinoma causing SAADH. Then the other one is drugs, vincristin, vinca alkaloids. Clinical features are due to hyponatremia. Serum osmolality will be reduced. Urine osmolality will be increased. Serum sodium will be reduced. Urine sodium will be increased. Investigation of choice is water loading test. Drug of choice will be Vaptans. Okay? Right. Then you answer this question quickly. A 35-year-old male presenting with vomiting and as well as confusion. On examination, serum sodium is 120 millimoles per liter, potassium is 4.2 millimoles per liter, and uric acid is 2 milligrams per deciliter. And patient is not edematous. So, what do you think is the diagnosis in this clinical scenario? Right. Any one of you? What do you think is the diagnosis? So, the diagnosis in this patients is nothing but the cerebral toxoplasmosis with SADH. Right. Now, what is the very important point here? That is hyponatremia. So hyponatremia will be there even in hepatic failure. Hy hyponatremia will be there in congestive heart failure also. But why not hepatic failure and as well as congestive heart failure is not the answer because in those patients the individual will be edematous. Right? Hepatic failure, edema will be there. Congestive heart failure, edema will be there. But our patient is not edematous. So that is the reason why those two options are ruled out. Then you take severe dehydration. In severe dehydration, the individual can have the hyponatremia and the individual is not edematous. Why not the answer being C? Why? Because in this patients, if you observe the uric acid, normal uric acid levels is how much? 3 to 7 milligrams per deciliter. And in patients with SADH, there will be decrease in the uric acid levels. But that does not happen in patients with the severe dehydration. So that is the reason why your severe dehydration is also not the answer. The answer is what? Cerebral toxoplasmosis secondary to SADH. Okay? So we are done with the disorders related to the ADH. Now I will give you, I hope everyone has understood this question. So just give me a quick thumbs up if you have understood this clinical scenario.
okay right then okay so i have given you the different clinical scenarios right so this patient presented with polyuria okay normal sodium levels joseph it is 135 to 145 milli equivalents per liter right 135 to 145 is the normal serum sodium levels theek hai right then now okay so and this the second scenario the patient presented with the hyponatremia and third scenario patient present with polyuria and fourth scenario also the patient presented with polyuria okay so can anyone quickly tell me what are these three different four different conditions serum osmolality and urine osmolality is given so in which condition the serum osmolality is increased and urine osmolality is decreased that is in patients with diabetes insipidus where they will present with polyuria theek hai right and you take the second scenario second scenario the patient presented with symptoms of hyponatremia with serum osmolality decreased urine osmolality increased so you will come across this in patients with syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone theek hai and you take the third scenario the third scenario is the patient presented with polyuria but his serum osmolality is normal but urine osmolality is increased so where do you think you come across this clinical condition this clinical condition you will come across in patients who are diabetes mellitus because in diabetes mellitus the glucose gets excreted in the urine so that is the reason why there will be increase in urine osmolality in diabetes mellitus and you take the fourth scenario that is this one the patient presented with polyuria serum osmolality decreased and urine osmolality is also decreased so where do you come across this you come across this in patients with psychogenic polydipsia right you come across this in patients with psychogenic polydipsia right so that is about the four important clinical scenarios with a different serum and urine osmolality in summarized manner theek hai right then after this let me quickly discuss about the hyperprolactinemia right so what is the what are the physiological causes for hyperprolactinemia the physiological causes for hyperprolactinemia will be lactation then pregnancy right then the next very very important condition is sleep and next stress so these are the physiological causes for the hyperprolactinemia then you should know what are the tumors that will cause hyperprolactinemia one is your prolactinoma and the other one is craniopharyngioma prolactinoma and craniopharyngioma then what are the systemic causes for hyperprolactinemia systemic causes include chronic renal failure then cirrhosis of liver and next primary hypothyroidism right primary hypothyroidism then what are the drugs which will cause hyperprolactinemia can anyone tell me what are the drugs which will cause hyperprolactinemia quickly drugs causing hyperprolactinemia will be simetidine right and then we have an anti emetic drug that is metaclopramide okay and the next very important drug that we have is your atypical antipsychotics that is risperidone right and so these are all the drugs which can present with hyperprolactinemia then this prolactinomas we have two types depending upon the size microadenoma the size of the tumor is less than 10 mm macroadenoma the size of the tumor will be more than 10 mm what is the difference between these two clinically microadenoma you have only endocrine manifestations macroadenoma along with endocrine manifestations you also have the mass effect you also have the mass effect now what is that endocrine manifestations that you come across in the males endocrine manifestations that you come across in the males will be infertility that is one very important thing right infertility okay and there will be decreased libido okay so these two are the endocrine manifestations in males and what are the endocrine manifestations in females because of hyperprolactinemia one will be galactoria right galactoria then even females they will have infertility right and next is the amenorrhea that is absence of menstruation now what will be the clinical features in macroadenoma because of mass effect because of mass effect 
there will be bitemporal hemianopia right bitemporal hemianopia okay and this bitemporal hemianopia initially it starts with bitemporal superior quadrantanopia okay initially it will be bitemporal superior quadrantanopia followed by that there will be bitemporal hemianopia whereas craniopharyngioma craniopharyngioma it is bitemporal inferior quadrantanopia right inferior quadrantanopia and even craniopharyngioma will cause the features of the hyperprolactinemia okay then what is the investigation of choice in hyperprolactinemia that is increase in prolactin levels normal value is 5 to 20 nanograms per ml but in these individuals it will be more than 200 nanograms per ml and why is that we have to do the mri the mri we have to do in order to determine the size of the tumor then what is the first line treatment first line treatment will be medical management whether it is micro or macro adenoma so what will be the first line management in a pregnant female in pregnant female please remember the drug of choice will be bromocriptin whereas in non pregnant female or in males with prolactinoma the drug of choice will be cabergolin please remember these two important points okay bromocriptin in pregnant female drug of choice whereas non pregnant female and as well as in males with hyperprolactinemia cabergolin is the drug of choice and surgical treatment is what surgical treatment is transphenoidal okay so transphenoidal pituitary adenectomy has to be done so this is about your hyperprolactinemia or prolactinoma so quick recap of the entire prolactinoma okay right then coming to yeah uh, habiba how long you have to give us until the prolactin level reduces to the normal value and as well as there should be also decrease in the size of the tumor until then you need to give this particular treatment okay right now you see this clinical scenario that is a 35 year old female presented with one year history of menstrual irregularity and galacturia she also has on and off headache her examination revealed bitemporal superior quadrantanopia fundus examination showed primary optic atrophy so which of the following is diagnosis in this case now if you take this clinical scenario along with the features of hyperprolactinemia there is also mass effect so the answer will be pituitary macroadenoma now you may ask me the question why not craniopharyngioma why because see craniopharyngioma please remember always the presentation will be in the extremes of age so it is bimodal age of presentation right bimodal age of presentation okay just give me one second okay right now okay now we'll take up the next important clinical scenario so the next so that was about your story of prolactin next important clinical scenario is a 58 year old man undergoes severe head trauma and develops pituitary insufficiency right develops pituitary insufficiency after recovery he is placed on thyroid hormone testosterone glucocorticoids and vasopressin on a routine visit he questions his primary care physician regarding potential growth hormone deficiency all of the following are potential signs and symptoms of growth hormone deficiency except right the answer is except any one of you please yes okay so growth hormone deficiency will not cause increase in the bone mineral density right growth hormone deficiency will not cause increase in the bone mineral density right next now whereas abnormal lipid profile atherosclerosis increased waist hip ratio and left ventricular dysfunction will be there whenever there is left ventricular sorry whenever there is hypopituitarism now let me quickly recap the topic of the hypopituitarism okay so if you take hypopituitarism what is the most common cause of hypopituitarism the most common cause of the hypopituitarism will be pan that is pituitary adenoma okay so pituitary adenoma that will be the most common cause for hypopituitarism 
and postpartum hypopituitarism is what is called as Sheehan syndrome. Right? It is what is called as Sheehan syndrome. Now, what is the first hormone that will be reduced in patients with hypopituitarism? Please remember, it is the growth hormone which will be reduced first and followed by that, the sex hormones. What will be that sex hormones? That is FSH and as well as the LH that will be reduced next. Then how will you diagnose that the growth hormone is reduced? One is your provocative test that is insulin induced hypoglycemia. So how much of insulin you should give? You should give 0.1 microgram per kg of insulin that will induce hypoglycemia whenever there is hypoglycemia there should be increase in your growth hormone but in hypopituitarism there will be failure of increase in growth hormone so hypoglycemia should induce the growth hormone levels just give me one minute Just one second, one second, guys. Yeah. Right. So, yes. So, this insulin induced hypoglycemia, when you give 0.1 microgram per kg of regular insulin, that will induce hypoglycemia. And whenever there is hypoglycemia, there should be increase in growth hormone levels more than 10 milligrams per deciliter, right? And that is a pro, but here what will happen? There will be failure of increase in growth hormone levels. Okay. And because this is a provocative test, that is the individual may land up in hypoglycemia. So the other important test that will increase the growth hormone is arginine infusion test. Even arginine infusion can stimulate the increase in growth hormone levels. But in spite of giving arginine, if growth hormone level does not increase, then it is suggestive of hypopituitarism. Now, Okay, whenever there is hypopituitarism, what is the first drug that has to be supplemented? Any one of you, what is the first drug that has to be supplemented? The first drug that has to be supplemented in patients with hypopituitarism will be the steroids. Okay, that will be steroids. Okay, right. So, that is about your hypopituitarism. Now, after that, now let me discuss the another important clinical scenario. Yes. Okay, I hope everyone will be able to identify this image. This is the image of the acromegaly, right? Image of acromegaly. So in acromegaly, you have bony manifestations and soft tissue manifestations. And acromegaly is what increase in growth hormone after the fusion of the bones. So what all will be the features? Number one, if you take the face, there will be frontal bosing, right? There is frontal bosing. And how is the nose of the individual? the nose of the individual will be a broad nose and like there will be protrusion of the jaw that is nothing but your prognathism and within the jaw you have widely spaced teeth so this will be the bony abnormality within the face and you take the bony abnormality within the hands and lower limbs within the hands you will observe that okay you will observe that there are large hands okay and that is broad hands and even the fingers if you see they are swollen. The swollen fingers are there. So that is the reason why the glove size increases. And what will happen to the shoe size if you take the foot? Even there is enlargement of the foot. Okay. So even the shoe size is also increased. And imaging is very, very important in patients with acromegaly. So when you do an x-ray of this isolated digit, right? X-ray of an isolated digit. So can anyone tell me what is this particular appearance called as? Yes. What is this appearance called? This is called, yes, this is spade-like appearance of the individual digit, okay? And when you take the x-ray of the lateral view of the foot, right? What is that you will observe within the x-ray of the lateral view of the foot? You see here, in the x-ray of the lateral view of the foot, you will observe that there is increase in the heel pad thickness. 
right there is increase in the heel pad thickness and you should know at that same time how much is the normal heel pad thickness the normal heel pad thickness is around 11 to 21 mm but in these individuals there will be increase in the heel pad thickness okay right then quickly you should know what is the first line investigation what is the first line investigation any one of you first line investigation is you have to check for the somatomedin levels igf1 levels are elevated okay somatomedin levels are elevated then what is the investigation of choice investigation of choice is the growth hormone suppression test what you will do you will give 100 grams of glucose load and when you give 100 grams of glucose the growth hormone should reduce but what happens here in spite of glucose load the growth hormone suppression does not occur that will be the investigation of choice okay right then what is the treatment of choice in case of the acromegaly you need to do surgical resection of the pituitary adenoma whether it is micro or macro adenoma you should do surgical resection and if the individual is not supportive for surgery then what is the first line drug if the individual is not supportive for surgery you need to give somatostatin analog and that particular somatostatin analog will be octreotide okay and if there is mammosomatotroph type of pituitary adenoma causing acromegaly then in this case you need to give bromocriptin right you need to give bromocriptin okay then what is the second line drug for the treatment of the acromegaly that will be pegvisomant pegvisomant what exactly is the mechanism of action it is endogenic growth hormone receptor antagonist endogenic growth hormone receptor antagonist and whenever there is severe persistent acromegaly the drug that we give is reloxifen okay reloxifen it will not reduce your growth hormone levels but what this reloxifen will do is reloxifen will reduce the igf1 levels it will normalize the igf1 levels that is what is your reloxifen so that was about your acromegaly in detail right next after having discussed about the disorders related to the pituitary you see the next question so question is a patient presents with intermittent headache on examination there is hypertension and a thyroid nodule which of the following step is to be taken next you have to measure the urine hydroxy indolestic acid level urine vma and aspiration of thyroid nodule ultrasound of the abdomen echocardiography so what is that you have to do right very good reen so that is urine vma and as well as thyroid nodule so basically it is nothing but a men syndrome what type of men syndrome is this it is men to be right it is men to be right now if you take in detail about all the men syndromes in one page so you take men one what is another name for this men one the another name for this men one this is also called as wormer syndrome whereas men to a this is called as the sipple syndrome whereas men to b or men 3 this is called wagenman froboise syndrome right wagenman froboise syndrome okay right then what are the endocrine tumors in men 1 endocrine tumors in men 1 are parathyroid tumors that is parathyroid adenoma and hyperplasia then pituitary adenoma and pituitary hyperplasia then pancreatic adenoma and as well as pancreatic hyperplasia these are the three important tumors out of this which is the most common most common will be the parathyroid tumors okay right then followed by that extra endocrine manifestations extra endocrine manifestations in these individuals will be carcinoids okay so what carcinoid is this this will be the foregut carcinoid right it will be foregut carcinoid foregut carcinoid and whereas if you take the pancreatic tumors what is the most common pancreatic tumor most common pancreatic tumor will be peepoma right that is polypeptidoma okay right then extra endocrine manifestations will be foregut carcinoids and as well as the angiofibromas and collagenomas so extra endocrine manifestations are foregut carcinoids angioma angiofibroma and collagenoma then what is the gene which is being mutated the gene which is being mutated is a tumor suppressor gene that is men1 on which chromosome is this men1 gene present it is present on chromosome 11 then coming to your men2 a men2 a the mnemonic is tap T stands for thyroid abnormalities. What is that thyroid abnormalities? That is medullary carcinoma of thyroid. A stands for the adrenal pheochromocytoma. 
and the word p stands for parathyroid tumor that is parathyroid adenoma or parathyroid hyperplasia and you have extra endocrine manifestations even in men 2a also what is that that will be hirschsprung's disease and the other very important will be the amyloidosis most of the students they do mistake it amyloidosis please remember extra endocrine manifestations in men 2a will be amyloidosis and the gene which is being mutated is ret proto oncogene and chromosome on which this is present is the chromosome 10 then you take men 2b which is also called men 3 so in this you have medullary carcinoma of thyroid and then adrenal pheochromocytoma will be there but parathyroid tumors will not be there in men 2b or men 3 and what are the extra endocrine manifestations they are mainly neuromas and what are these neuromas gastrointestinal neuroma and as well as the mucosal neuromas and they also have the marfanoid habitus hmm they also have the marfanoid habitus and the gene which is being mutated is ret proto oncogene and chromosome which is being present is the chromosome 10 then you take the men 4 men 4 you have reproductive organ tumors so in males you have testicular tumors whereas in females there will be cervical tumors and the other two pieces are common that is parathyroid tumor will be there and pituitary tumor will be there and along with this there will be also adrenal plus renal tumor right along with this it is adrenal and renal tumor and what is the gene that is being mutated in men 4 the gene which is being mutated in men 4 that will be cdk n1b and this cdk n1b it is present on chromosome 12 right it is present on chromosome 12 okay so that is about your the men syndromes in total in just 3 to 4 minutes okay right then we will come on to the discussion of the adrenal gland disorders okay right so if you take the adrenal gland disorders right so out of which let me first take up the discussion of the cushing syndrome if the question is asked what is the most common cause of cushings most common cause of cushings will be the iatrogenic steroid supplementation will be the most common cause of cushings and what is the most common cause of non iatrogenic cushings that will be pituitary adenoma and what is the most common cause of acth dependent type of cushings again the answer is same that is pituitary adenoma and what is the most common cause of ectopic acth producing cushings that will be your small cell carcinoma of the lung right that will be small cell carcinoma of the lung and what is the most common cause of acth independent type of cushings that will be adrenal adenoma so this is about the various etiologies that are causing cushings and within the cushings you should know the earliest clinical feature of the cushings what is that the earliest clinical feature of the cushings will be the weight gain that is very very important point okay right then what are the other clinical features that you will come across in cushings the other clinical features that you will come across in cushings is due to increase in free fatty acids there will be see there is increase due to increase in free fatty acids there is fat redistribution so that will give rise to your buffalo hump right and there will be also development of central obesity and what will be the dermatological manifestation the dermatological manifestation will be the purple striae and what will happen to glucose metabolism in cushings there will be hyperglycemia and cardiovascular system manifestations in cushings there will be hypertension neurological manifestations in cushings will be psychosis and your hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis this is very common in ectopic acth production rather than the pituitary acth proximal muscle weakness is due to increase in protein breakdown hmm? that, that is due to increase in protein breakdown and how will be the bone in these individuals there will be osteoporotic bone and the signs of androgen excess they are seen in females and what will be that signs of androgen excess that will be increased libido and there will be acne in females okay so these are the clinical manifestations that you will have in cushings then how will you diagnose this cushing syndrome that what is the first biochemical change the first biochemical change in cushings will be 
loss of diurnal variation okay loss of diurnal variation it will be the first biochemical change that means early in the morning also steroids will be high later in the part of the day also steroids will be very high first line investigation will be 24 hour urinary cortisol levels will be elevated that will be the first line investigation and once 24 hour urinary cortisol levels are elevated then you have to check the ACTH if ACTH levels are low then it is AC what is that that will be ACTH independent type of pushings and if ACTH levels are high then you have to consider it as ACTH dependent type of pushings okay and this high dose dexamethasone it will differentiate pituitary acth from the ectopic acth and when you give high dose dexamethasone if suppose if acth levels are reduced then that will be pituitary adenoma if the acth levels are still high in spite of this high dose dexamethasone that will be your ectopic acth and MRI of the pituitary you have to do in this scenario where there is decreased ACTH in response to high dose dexamethasone suppression test. That is mainly to determine the size. But the sensitivity of your MRI is only 90%. Sensitivity MRI is only 90%. So in 10% of individuals, even though there is pituitary adenoma, the MRI may be normal. So in them, you need to do petrosal venous sinus sampling. When you do petrosal venous sinus sampling, you will observe that there is increase in the ACTH levels if it is pituitary adenoma. Okay. So that is about the investigations lineup. Right. Investigations lineup in the uh, Cushing syndrome. Okay. Right. Then coming to the surgical treatment. Okay. So what is the treatment of choice? The treatment of choice in case of Cushing's will be the surgical treatment. Okay. You need to do pituitary adenectomy or adrenal adenectomy should be done. But the problem is when you do, when there is, uh, when you, when the individual is unable or not fit for surgery, then you need to do medical adrenalectomy. And what is that medical adrenalectomy done with? The medical adrenalectomy should be given, should be done with ketoconazole. Now, many of you may ask me a question, see, ketoconazole is an antifungal drug and how is it useful in Cushing's? It is an adrenal enzyme inhibitor. Mm, it's an adrenal enzyme inhibitor. It will prevent the steroid synthesis. In that way, your ketoconazole will be useful. So, in 5 minutes, the entire Cushing's is over. Okay, so answer this. In which endocrine disorder do you observe this? Dermatological changes. Any one of you? In which endocrine disorder do you observe this dermatological changes? Right. So, this is your purple striae, which is nothing but Cushing's. Right. And the later, if you see, this is your knuckle pigmentation. Right. This is your knuckle pigmentation. So, knuckle pigmentation and as well as mucous membrane pigmentation, you come across this in very good. You come across this in Addison's. Okay. Right. Then, after having discussed about the Cushing's, let me quickly recap Quan syndrome in just two minutes. So, what is the most common cause of primary hyperaldosteronism? Most common cause of primary hyperaldosteronism will be bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. Right. And what is the most common cause of Quan syndrome? Most common cause of Quan syndrome will be adrenal adenoma. So remember, your Quan syndrome, we cannot use this word for adrenal hyperplasia. And what are the causes for secondary hyperaldosteronism? The causes for secondary hyperaldosteronism will be congestive heart failure and as well as the cirrhosis of liver. Okay. And in hyperaldosteronism, there is increased sodium and water retention. So because of which, what will be the clinical features? The clinical features will be the diastolic hypertension. And please remember, very, very important point there is no edema. Why there is no edema in these individuals in spite of sodium and water retention? There will be development of aldosterone escape phenomenon. So that is the reason why there is no edema. And because of aldosterone escape phenomenon, there will be polyuria in these patients. And potassium excretion will be there. That will result in hypokalemia and that will cause muscle weakness. And there will be ventricular arrhythmias. That is ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. And because of H plus ion excretion, there is metabolic alkalosis. What is the first line investigation? That is aldosterone renin ratio. 
So aldosterone renin ratio will be elevated in these patients. That is a first line investigation. And what is the investigation of choice in Kohn syndrome? Investigation of choice will be oral salt solution test. In those individuals who cannot consume oral salt solution, you need to do IV saline separation test. Then what is the first line treatment? The first line treatment in these patients with the Kohn syndrome, that will be the surgical resection of the tumor. But the problem is, if there is bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, then you cannot do surgical resection if there is bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. So in such case, you need to give aldosterone antagonist and that aldosterone antagonist will be spironolactone. Or if the patient develops tender gynecomastia secondary to spironolactone, then you need to give epilirinone. Okay, so that is about quick discussion. Within two minutes, the entire Kohn syndrome is done. Right now, let me take up the next important that is Addison's. So even Addison's, I'll just try to quickly revise in two minutes. Okay, right. What is Addison's? It is adrenocortical insufficiency. What is the most common cause in India? That will be tuberculosis. And what is the most common cause in the Western countries? That will be autoimmune adrenalitis. And what is the fungal infection that will cause Addison's? That will be histoplasmosis. And what will be the viral infection that will be causing Addison's? That will be cytomegalovirus. And infiltrative disorders causing the Addison's will be the hemochromatosis, right? And then amyloidosis. Okay, then what is adrenomyeloleukodystrophy? It is an X-linked disorder and this is very commonly seen in males responsible for Addison's and these individuals, they also have neurological manifestations and there is accumulation of the free fatty acids as well. Then adrenal hemorrhage causing Addison's will be secondary to your Neisseria meningitis infection and that will be waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome, where the individual will have acute adrenal insufficiency. Now, the next important point is drug of choice. Drug of choice in these individuals will be the hydrocortisone, right? Hydrocortisone, okay, right. What will be the clinical features? One, due to steroid deficiency, the individual can have the hypoglycemia, right? Second, due to aldosterone deficiency, there will be hyponatremia, there will be hyperkalemia and there will be metabolic acidosis. Because there is hyponatremia, the individual will be having, right, because there is hyponatremia, the individual will be having the craving for salt, salt craving will be there, okay, right, and there will be weak sex hormone deficiency that is particularly in females, that is the reason why the individual will have weakness very severe weakness and there is also loss of libido right there is also loss of libido and then what is the investigation of choice in addison's the investigation of choice in addison's will be cosyntopin test okay then what is the drug of choice for primary adrenocortical insufficiency that will be dexamethasone and drug of choice i'm sorry Drug of choice for primary adrenocortical insufficiency will be hydrocortisone and drug of choice for secondary adrenocortical insufficiency will be dexamethasone, okay? Then you take hyperpigmentation. See, this hyperpigmentation is very common in primary adrenocortical insufficiency, right? And this hyperpigmentation will be first seen over the palm and as well as the sole creases. And hypopigmented skin, that is called as alabaster skin, that you come across in secondary adenocortical insufficiency. Okay, so that is about Addison's in just two minutes, the entire Addison's in two minutes. Okay, now I'll just show you one clinical question. Please answer this. Yes, a woman was admitted this morning in the medical ICU for elective cholecystectomy. Before surgery, her physical examination including vitals were normal. The patient, the procedure went on well and there was no noticeable complications. However, three hours after returning to her room, she was noted to be unresponsive and her blood pressure was barely palpable. She was intubated for respiratory failure. Her blood pressure has been refractory to IV fluids and pressors. You are consulted to help in the workup of suspected adrenal insufficiency. Which of the following statements regarding adrenal insufficiency is true? Which of the following statements regarding adrenal insufficiency is true? Any one of you? The true statement. Yes, P, what is the answer? 
so you take the first option in usa most common cause it is not tuberculosis it is autoimmune adenitis right and you take the second option right the critical test for diagnosis of chronic adrenal insufficiency is cosyntopin test that is a true statement okay right and secondary adrenocortical insufficiency is treated with hydrocortisone is a wrong statement we give dexamethasone not hydrocortisone for treating secondary adrenocortical insufficiency okay then ct scan of the adrenal gland will show enlarged adrenal gland is a wrong statement you will have a moth eaten adrenal gland right there will be moth eaten adrenal gland okay so the correct answer here will be b all right now we'll move on to the next question that is the next topic that is pheochromocytoma so pheochromocytoma entire pheochromocytoma only just two minutes okay right so it is a tumor which is originating from adrenal medulla and the cells are called neuroendocrine cells or chromaffin cells and what is the most predominant hormone from pheochromocytoma the most predominant hormone from the pheochromocytoma will be norepinephrine okay and what is the okay this uh, pheochromocytomas they are not only present within the adrenal medulla you also have extra adrenal pheochromocytoma as well what is the most common site of extra adrenal pheochromocytoma that is abdominal parietic area and that abdominal parietic area is nothing but organ of zucker candle organ of zucker candle that is the most common extra adrenal pheochrome most common site of extra adrenal pheochromocytoma which is nothing but abdominal parietic area and most common symptom in pheochromocytoma will be headache right and why is this headache most common sign will be hypertension it is because of hypertension you come across this headache and that too the occipital headache is very common then what is a triad in pheochromocytoma the triad in pheochromocytoma will be one is headache there will be development of palpitations okay and the next important thing is profuse sweating so why is this headache that is because of the hypertension why is this palpitation that is because of your tachyarrhythmias and why this sweating that is because of increase in your basal metabolic rate and what will happen to glucose metabolism in pheochromocytoma there will be hyperglycemia and what is the first line investigation and confirmatory test in pheochromocytoma <coughs> so So the first line investigation will be 24 hour urinary metabolites of catecholamine levels are elevated that will be the first line investigation then what is the confirmatory test the confirmatory test will be plasma metanephrine levels right plasma metanephrine levels okay and how many times this plasma metanephrine level should be elevated more than four times it has to be elevated right more than four times and if it is elevated less than four times either it could be because of anxiety or because of pheochromocytoma if it is elevated less than four times then how will you rule out whether it is pheochromocytoma or anxiety then you need to do clonidine suppression test right you need to do clonidine suppression test when you do clonidine suppression test if it is like anxiety the catecholamine levels will get normalized but if it is pheochromocytoma then the catecholamine levels will still remain elevated then what is the treatment of choice in patients with pheochromocytoma the treatment of choice in pheochromocytoma will be surgical resection of the tumor then what is the medical management in patients with pheochromocytoma see before doing surgery you have to see that the blood pressure is reduced to less than 160 by 80 mm of mercury so for that you need to give medical management that is an alpha blocker and that particular alpha blocker that you will give is phenoxybenzamine right you need to give phenoxybenzamine that will be the medical management you will be giving in order to reduce the blood pressure to less than 160 by 90 the alternative drug is that you can also give labetalol as well okay so that was your pheochromocytoma just in 3 minutes so and even extra adrenal pheochromocytoma also the predominant hormone will be norepinephrine and what is the investigation that you will do for uh, localizing the tumor the investigation that you will be doing for localizing the extra adrenal pheochromocytoma will be gallium 68 dotatate scan gallium 68 dotatate scan is the one which is useful for localizing the tumor okay 
so that was your pheochromocytoma in just two to three minutes then coming to your hyperparathyroidism so hyperparathyroidism you have primary hyperparathyroidism where the problem within the parathyroid gland itself most common cause will be parathyroid adenoma that will be the most common cause and other causes will be parathyroid carcinoma and parathyroid hyperplasia and secondary hyperparathyroidism you will see that in patients with chronic renal failure vitamin d deficiency then malabsorption syndrome and medullary carcinoma of thyroid these are all the causes for secondary hyperparathyroidism now in these individuals there will be increased calcium and because of this increased calcium what will be the manifestations the manifestations will be the calcium will go and deposit within the brain there will be psychosis the calcium will go and deposit within the skin there will be calcinosis cutis and the calcium will also go and deposit within the kidney causing renal stones and when calcium levels are 12 to 13 the calcium can also go and deposit within the basal ganglia causing degeneration of basal ganglia that is parkinsonism and when the calcium levels are more than 13 milligrams percentage there will be death of the individual and what is the cause of death in these individuals that is systolic arrest right systolic arrest will be the cause of death then coming to the bony abnormalities so bony abnormalities that will be because of increased bone resorption you will have this characteristic vertebra that is vertebra similar to that of a codfish and that we call it as codfish spine and another important abnormality within the spine that you will have is rugger jersey spine okay rugger jersey spine then you take the abnormality within the skull there will be pinhead stippling because of excessive bony resorption and there will be also loss of lamina dura that is due to demineralization of the bone and within the uh, oral cavity there will be development of a tumor that is called epilis tumor and what is the investigation that you will be doing for localizing this parathyroid adenoma that is technetium 99m system eb scan hmm? technetium 99m system eb scan so these are image based questions that you will come across in patients with the hyperparathyroidism then coming to the investigations so investigations if you see there will be hypercalcemia there will be decrease in the phosphorus levels what will happen to urine calcium urine calcium is also elevated what will happen to urine phosphorus or urine phosphate that will be also elevated and what will happen to the alkaline phosphatase levels it is a marker of bony turnover that will also be elevated then coming to the bone mineral density t score and z score t score you have to compare with a 30 year old individual who is lg and same gender and z score you have to compare with same age individuals and how much is the normal t score more than or equal to minus 1.0 is a normal t score and how much is the normal z score more than or equal to 2 is a normal z score less than that will be your osteopenia or osteoporosis and what will be the treatment of choice the treatment of choice in parathyroid adenoma will be the surgical resection then what is the drug of choice right drug of choice for reducing the calcium in patients with hyperparathyroidism then you need to give bisphosphonates and that particular bisphosphonates will be the alendronate right or zolindronic acid or pamidronate should be given okay then what is the first line treatment for reducing the calcium levels that is your normal saline and what are the other treatment options the other treatment options are calcitonin can be given and you can also give furosemide so calcitonin and furosemide both of these can also reduce the calcium levels so that is about your primary hyperparathyroidism in just three minutes okay right now coming to your hypoparathyroidism so if you take this hypoparathyroidism what is the etiology of your hypoparathyroidism so the etiology of acute hypoparathyroidism will be thyroid surgery that means a thyroid goiter is there and you have done thyroid resection that is that can result in acute hypoparathyroidism then what are the causes for chronic hypoparathyroidism that can be secondary to radiotherapy to the neck for lymphoma 
or that can be secondary to your hypomagnesemia. Magnesium is required for release of parathormone from parathyroid gland. If magnesium is not there, that can result in chronic hypoparathyroidism. And another very, very important condition is Digeord syndrome. So everyone is aware of this pneumonic if I am not wrong, that is CATCH-22. So C stands for cardiac abnormalities, A stands for abnormal phases, T stands for thymic absence or abnormality, then H stands for hypocalcemia and 22 stands for abnormality is on chromosome number 22. Then what will be the clinical features of acute hypoparathyroidism? Mainly there will be tetany. Right? And what would be the cause of death in these individuals? The cause of death in these individuals will be laryngospasm. Whereas hyperparathyroidism, that is systolic arrest. Whereas here, it is laryngospasm. Then the other features of acute hypoparathyroidism will be perioral paresthesia and periungual paresthesia. And then you need to know two important signs. One is tracheal sign and the other one is trostic sign. I'll show you both of those images. Then, what are the clinical features of the chronic hypoparathyroidism? In chronic hypoparathyroidism, you'll have the features similar to that of the vitamin D deficiency. There will be softening of the skull and there will be delayed dentition and there will be bony abnormalities that is genovarum or genovalgum. Okay, so genovarum is bow shaped legs. Genovalgum is knock knees. Okay, right. Then what will be the ECG features in hypoparathyroidism? See, because of hypocalcemia, you will be having long QT interval. And what are the investigations? Calcium levels will be reduced. Phosphorus levels will be elevated. <coughs> and parathormone levels are also elevated. Then how do you treat this acute hypoparathyroidism? Acute hypoparathyroidism, you need to give intravenous calcium gluconate. Then how do you treat your uh, chronic hypoparathyroidism? In chronic hypoparathyroidism, you will be giving oral calcium gluconate or we give vitamin D. Then lastly, you should know pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. In pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, calcium levels are, sorry, parathormone levels are normal. But what is that problem then? Parathormone receptor is resistant. And because of which, the individual will have hypocalcemia. Right? And what is the treatment in your pseudo-hypoparathyroidism now? You need to give calcium gluconate supplementation because there is hypocalcemia. So this is about your hypoparathyroidism. Then we have a form of pseudo-hypoparathyroidism that is pseudo-hypoparathyroidism type 1A. In pseudo-hypoparathyroidism type 1A, the individual will have what is called Albright hereditary osteodystrophy. And these patients, they have short fourth and as well as fifth metacarpal bones. So whenever there is short fourth and fifth metacarpal bones and when they make a fist, they will get a classical, see this is a normal fist, this is knuckle, this is knuckle, this is also knuckle, this is also knuckle. But in case of pseudo hypoparathyroidism type 1A because of short fourth and fifth metacarpals, they will have a knuckle, they will have a knuckle. But because 4th and 5th metacarpals are short, there will be a dimple and there will be a dimple. And that we call it as knuckle, knuckle, dimple, dimple sign. Okay. And what will be the differential diagnosis of this? The differential diagnosis will be the Down syndrome, where the third metacarpal will be short. So in case of Down syndrome, you will have knuckle, dimple, knuckle, knuckle sign. Whereas you take Turner syndrome. In Turner syndrome, the fourth metacarpal is short, right? So you will get knuckle, knuckle, dimple, knuckle sign, right? So this is about your knuckle, knuckle, dimple, dimple sign, which you get in case of pseudo hypoparathyroidism type 1A. Now, yes, coming to the signs. In hypoparathyroidism, you get this chostic sign in case of latent tetany. What is this chostic sign? You tap the facial now at the angle of mandible, there will be spasm of the muscles on that half of the face. Basically, you are tapping the facial nerve there. Okay, that is called chostic sign. The other one is the torsion sign. You inflate the BP cuff to more than 20 millimeters of mercury and wait for 1 to 2 minutes. There will be development of carpopedal spasm, which is nothing but tetany. And this torsion sign you come across at two other places. We have what is called torsion lymph node. And torsion lymph node, you come across this in patients with 
carcinoma of the stomach where there will be metastasis to the left supraclavicular lymph node which we call it as virtuous lymph node the other one is the trosher syndrome trosher syndrome that is nothing but your migratory thrombophlebitis you come across this in patients with carcinoma of the pancreas carcinoma of the pancreas okay so this is about your in toto on the hypoparathyroidism right so your parathyroid disorders are done then next what we have is the thyroid disorders so let me just quickly compare hyperthyroidism and hypothy hypothyroidism so in hyperthyroidism the basal metabolic rate will be elevated so that is the reason why the individual will have weight loss and there will be heat intolerance whereas in hypothyroidism the bmr decreases because the bmr decreases i'm very sorry i'm very sorry so in hypothyroidism there will be weight loss in hyperthyroidism you have weight loss in hyperthyroidism whereas in hypothyroidism you will have weight gain right you will have weight gain and there will be cold intolerance and what will happen to glucose the thyroid hormone will increase hepatic gluconeogenesis so in hyperthyroidism there will be hyperglycemia immediately after taking the food whereas in myxodema coma there will be development of hypoglycemia okay then what will happen to lipid levels thyroid will cause excessive lipolysis so there will be increase in free fatty acids and there will be decrease in cholesterol and there will be decrease in triglycerides whereas in hypothyroidism there is no lipolysis so there will be increase in cholesterol there will be increase in triglycerides and that will result in the coronary artery disease protein metabolism will be very high in hyperthyroidism that is the reason why the individual will have proximal muscle myopathy in hyperthyroidism whereas in hypothyroidism the individual will have only muscle fatigue right only muscle fatigue and what are the cardiac manifestations in hyperthyroidism there will be systolic hypertension and they are also prone for arrhythmias and which arrhythmia is more common atrial fibrillation whereas in hypothyroidism they will have bradycardia and they will develop diastolic hypertension and what will happen to respiratory rate in hyperthyroidism please remember there will be increase in respiratory rate resulting in tachypnea whereas in hypothyroidism the individual will develop type 2 respiratory failure which is characterized by hypoxia and hypercapnia and gat manifestations in hyperthyroidism is there will be increase in gastrointestinal motility resulting in diarrhea whereas in hypothyroidism there will be decrease in gastrointestinal motility resulting in constipation and neurological features in hyperthyroidism the individual will be having anxiety neurosis and there will be also tremors whereas hypothyroidism the individual will be dull and lethargic and there will be hung up reflex what do you mean by the word hung up reflex it is nothing but delayed relaxation of deep tendon reflexes and sleep if you take there will be decrease in sleep in hyperthyroidism and there will be excessive sleep in patients with hypothyroidism skin manifestations in hyperthyroidism you have this pretibial myxodema right you have this pretibial myxodema okay and whereas in hypothyroidism what will be the skin manifestations there will be yellowishness of the skin right there will be yellowishness of the skin why is that that is because of beta carotenemia okay and retrosternal goiter please remember there will be pemberton sign right pemberton sign what is this pemberton sign on raising the arm there will be facial congestion and there will be also redness of the upper limb that is called retrostern that is what is called pemberton sign <clears throat> and your infiltrative ophthalmopathy which is nothing but graves ophthalmopathy so in graves ophthalmopathy the individual will have the proptosis okay next the other important points right the other important points is <clears throat> jod based do so jod based do is what it is iodine induced hyperthyroidism whereas ulf chaikov it is iodine induced hypothyroidism so ye bahut easy hai yaad rakhne ka kaise wolf chaik off there is off okay that means thyroid hormone synthesis does not occur then you take amiodarone induced thyroiditis amiodarone induced thyroiditis type 
you will have hyperthyroidism which is similar to that of your jod based one whereas amiodarone induced thyroiditis type 2 initially there will be hyperthyroidism right initially there will be hyperthyroidism followed by that there will be hypothyroidism okay followed by that there will be hypothyroidism that is what is nothing but your amiodarone induced thyroiditis type 2 and your type 2 is mainly because of your lysosomal destruction theek hai right then coming to the treatment of your thyroid disorders so you take hypothyroid you need to give beta blockers why is that beta blockers are given mainly to reduce the tremors right mainly to reduce the tremors and beta blockers are also given that is to reduce the anxiety hmm? to reduce the anxiety and anti thyroid drugs what is the drug of choice right what is the drug of choice drug of choice if you take that is methimazole <clears throat> methimazole is the drug of choice for hyperthyroidism but in pregnancy in the first trimester we give propyl thiouracil because methimazole is teratogenic it can cause aplasia cutis <coughs> whereas in second and third trimester the drug what we give is again methimazole okay why because propyl thiouracil it is severely hepatotoxic it will cause severe hepatic fibrosis and not only that this propyl thiouracil it has the short half life compared to methimazole then iodine 131 treatment okay that is also for therapeutic purpose whereas iodine 123 and iodine 132 they are useful for diagnostic purpose iodine 131 is for the treatment purpose surgical resection when will you do mainly when there is mass effect of the goiter on the surrounding structures that is when you will do the surgical resection then coming to the treatment of hypothyroidism so the drug what we give in hypothyroidism is levothyroxine and what is the dosage 1.6 micrograms per kg body weight now the dosage completely depends upon whether there is cardiac disease present or absent if there is cardiac disease present then you have to start with 25 micrograms you have to start with 25 micrograms low dose when the cardiac disease is absent then you can give full dose that is 75 to 100 micrograms per kg can be given sorry 75 micrograms per day can be given okay and why is that you need to start low dose if there is cardiac disease because when you give full dose in patients with a cardiac disease thyroid hormone or thyroxine will increase the cardiac activity and if the individual is having underlying uh, coronary artery disease if the cardiac activity increases because of full dose of thyroxine there, there will be precipitation of underlying coronary artery disease so that is the reason why we don't give full dose if the individual is having cardiac disease now let me discuss some of the images related to the thyroid disorders okay so you see this what is this patient having so what is this sign it is nothing but your lid lag there is also periorbital edema and there is also proptosis and you come across this in patients with hyperthyroidism so basically it is your graves ophthalmopathy right then another important image based question will be <clears throat> okay so you observe this what is this abnormality in a patient with thyroid this is nothing but infiltrative dermopathy and what is that infiltrative dermopathy that infiltrative dermopathy is nothing but pretibial myxodema right pretibial myxodema okay right then then followed by that the next important is yes you see the next question you see the next image so if you observe the nails right how are the nails in the in which particular endocrine disorder you have this clubbing this we call it as the thyroid acropachy we call it as thyroid acropachy where endocrine disorder causing clubbing will be hyperthyroidism and as well as the acromegaly and when you take the x ray of the hands in these patients with thyroid acropachy what is that you will be having there will be periosteal right there will be peri periosteal thickening will be there or cortical thickening will be there okay so that is about the uh, thyroid acropachy then next important is you see the face of a patient with myxodema you have round face and you see the lips there will be swollen lips 
and the appearance of the face will be a dull appearance and if you clearly see here there is one important sign that you are observing here can anyone tell me what exactly is this sign what exactly is this sign yeah ali azar thoda thoda hindi hai okay thoda nahi mai pura hindi mein baat kar sakte but the english people will not understand <laughs> right so yes what is that this particular sign is nothing but your marderosis ye kya hoga marderosis so marderosis ka differential diagnosis kya hai marderosis ka differential diagnosis jo hai you come across this in patients with leprosy as well so leprosy right okay so <clears throat> what is this where later one third of the eyebrows are being lost so you come across this even in patients with the leprosy okay so that completes right that is that completes your thyroid related disorders theek hai right uske baad hoga aapka right so uske baad hoga aapka diabetes mellitus this will be the last endocrine disorder to do a quick revision so type 1 diabetes mellitus it is the one where there is hla association and what is the type of hla association in type 1 diabetes mellitus that is hla dr3 and as well as dr4 and it's an autoimmune condition okay and the type of antibodies will be ileitsil antibodies and the other one will be anti gad antibodies and these patients the bmi will be absolutely normal <clears throat> insulin levels will be completely reduced because there is beta cell destruction and what is the most common acute complication that is diabetic ketoacidosis right and how is the family history family history if you take in the first order relatives the chance of inheritance is only 7 to 10% and they'll have this classical clinical features like polyuria polydipsia and polyphagia and the drug of choice will be insulin in this individual hmm? drug of choice will be insulin in this individual then you take type 2 diabetes mellitus type 2 diabetes mellitus the age group at which you see this is more than 30 years whereas type 1 it is less than 20 years and type 2 diabetes mellitus what is the problem the most common risk factor will be obesity that is central obesity is the one which is responsible for your insulin resistance and insulin levels in these individuals either they are normal or increase later part of the day later part of the type 2 diabetes mellitus the insulin levels may be reduced and what is the most common acute complication in type 2 diabetes mellitus hyperosmolar non ketotic coma then what is the drug of choice for type 2 diabetes mellitus drug of choice for type 2 diabetes mellitus will be metformin right that will be metformin and you should know what are the other types <clears throat> so the other types they include many the so what are we discussing now other types of diabetes mellitus or other conditions which can cause the hyperglycemia so we have right we have very important condition that is modi that is maturity onset diabetes of young so if you take this maturity onset diabetes of young it is the one which is seen commonly in 20 to 30 years of age group and there is beta cell dysfunction in this individual it is not beta cell destruction it is it is beta cell dysfunction that you come across in these patients with the modi maturity onset diabetes of young and these individuals they should have very strong genetic in inheritance minimum two generations should be diabetic minimum two generations should be diabetic and this particular modi is mainly due to gene mutation and what is the most common form of modi most common form of modi will be modi 3 and in modi 3 what is a gene mutated the gene mutated will be hnf1 alpha that is hepatocyte nuclear factor 1 alpha that is what is your maturity onset diabetes of young and in these patients with modi right what is the drug of choice drug of choice will be low dose sulfonylureas right low dose sulfonylureas will be the drug of choice for modi okay then then we have lada that is latent autoimmune diabetes of adults so here the pathogenesis will be autoimmunity but in adults but in adults normally autoimmunity you come across in diabetes mellitus in children but here it is autoimmunity in adults okay and this is one of the rare condition and another name for this lada is type 1.5 diabetes mellitus and 
this your lada is mainly due to beta cell destruction and that is due to antibody formation and what is that antibody that particular antibody will be the anti gad antibodies right and here the beta cells are completely destroyed so the treatment that you have to give in these individual will be insulin okay so this is about your lada latent autoimmune diabetes of adults now next important thing you need to know is the drugs which will cause hyperglycemia the drugs which will cause hyperglycemia will be steroids okay and the nsaids right then your beta 2 agonists or your beta agonists can cause the hyperglycemia then vecor vecor is what it is a rodenticide which is useful for killing the rats then pentamidin pentamidin is what pentamidin is the drug which is used in the treatment of the pcp pneumonia pneumocystis carney pneumonia these are the drugs which can cause hyperglycemia fir endocrine conditions kya hoga endocrine conditions that will cause hyperglycemia that will cause hyperglycemia is acromegaly can cause hyperglycemia hyperthyroidism can cause your hyperglycemia pheochromocytoma can cause hyperglycemia cushing's can cause the hyperglycemia so these are all the endocrine conditions and one few more conditions are glucagonoma right glucagonoma can cause the hyperglycemia so these are the endocrinopathies and next is somatostatinoma right somatostatinoma these are the endocrine conditions which will cause the hyperglycemia then what are the genetic syndromes that will be responsible for your hyperglycemia is genetic syndromes we were discussing nephrogenic diabetes insipidus that is ulfram syndrome which is nothing but didmot syndrome and even downs can cause hyperglycemia your klein filter syndrome can cause hyperglycemia okay so this is about the etiologies that will be causing the hyperglycemia and very quickly that you need to know is the normal glucose levels okay so how much is the normal fasting blood glucose normal fasting blood glucose is less than 100 and how much is the normal postprandial blood glucose less than 140 how much is the normal hba1c less than 5.6 when do we use the word impaired impaired glucose tolerance fasting plasma glucose should be 101 to 125 two hour postprandial that will be 141 to 199 and impaired hba1c that will be 5.7 to 6.4 then what is the diabetic range so fasting should be more than or equal to 126 two hour postprandial should be more than or equal to 200 to call diabetes mellitus and hba1c should be more than 6.5 to call diabetes mellitus okay so this is about how do you investigate a patient with the diabetes mellitus then quick question what is the gold standard test what is the gold standard test for diagnosing the di diabetes mellitus the gold standard test for diagnosing diabetes mellitus will be ogtt that is oral glucose tolerance test right oral glucose tolerance test then a quick comparison between the hba1c and serum fructosamine hba1c it will give you the blood glucose levels of 3 months and serum fructosamine it will give you the blood glucose levels of past 2 to 3 weeks right past 2 to 3 weeks contraindications hba1c you should not do in case of the hemolytic anemias serum fructosamine you should not do in any condition wherever there is hypoalbuminemia like in patients with cirrhosis of liver don't do serum fructosamine and in patients with nephrotic syndrome don't do your serum fructosamine theek hai so this is about your hba1c and serum fructosamine then then quick question is about the treatment so type 1 diabetes mellitus drug of choice will be insulin and you have various types of insulin ultra short acting short acting intermediate acting and long acting insulins are there and drug of choice for type 2 diabetes mellitus will be metformin and even you have the new molecules what are those new molecules sglt2 inhibitors dpp4 inhibitors then we have glp1 analogs these are the other drugs but the drug of choice is metformin why is it considered why metformin is considered as drug of choice because it is the one which will cause maximum reduction of the hba1c it will reduce the hba1c by 2% it will reduce the hba1c by 2% that is the reason why your metformin is considered as drug of choice and the other advantages of metformin is metformin will also cause weight loss 
metformin will never cause the hypoglycemia mm, metformin will never cause hypoglycemia that is the reason why metformin is considered as drug of choice then lastly you should know the complications so what are the acute complications in diabetes mellitus that will be diabetic ketoacidosis hyperosmolar non ketotic coma then what are the chronic complications this has been asked recently chronic complications you should know what are the microvascular complications and what are the macrovascular complications microvascular complications will be diabetic neuropathy then diabetic nephropathy then diabetic retinopathy okay then macrovascular complications are coronary artery disease cerebrovascular accidents and peripheral arterial disease so these are the macrovascular complications okay now let me do a quick re revision between dka and as well as honk quick revision between diabetic ketoacidosis and honk in dka the glucose level will be more than 250 mg per deciliter whereas in honk the blood glucose levels will be in a range of 600 to 1200 mg percentage acidosis the ph will be reduced in diabetic ketoacidosis whereas in uh, honk there is no acidosis the ph will be normal ketone bodies will be present in diabetic ketoacidosis absent in case of the hyperosmolar non ketotic coma whereas diabetic ketoacidosis the serum osmolality it may remain normal or increased whereas in hyperosmolar non ketotic coma definitely the serum osmolality will be increased and clinical features mainly will be in the form of dyspnea that is because of acidosis and they will also have vomiting and as well as the abdominal tenderness and they will have a classical breathing pattern and that is called as the kusmols breathing the classical breathing pattern called kusmols breathing then you take honk hyperosmolar non ketotic coma they mainly have the cns manifestations that in the form of confusion and as well as seizures and that is because of increase in serum osmolality so respiratory pattern will be kusmols breathing pattern there is in diabetic ketoacidosis and treatment in diabetic ketoacidosis the first line treatment will be right the first line treatment will be the sodium chloride then you should give insulin and which type of insulin we give regular insulin has to be given and this regular insulin should be given iv and whenever you are giving this insulin infusion there can be development of hypokalemia so you should give kcl infusion also and this kcl infusion should be given when the potassium value is less than 5.1 if potassium value is more than 5.2 don't give kcl but if it is less than 5.1 you should give kcl then you take treatment in patients with hyperosmolar non ketotic coma the treatment is that in hyperosmolar non ketotic coma you give sodium chloride only that is 0.9 0.9 sodium chloride but if the serum sodium levels are more than 150 if the serum sodium levels are more than 150 that is the you should give half normal saline mm, that is the point when you should give half normal saline okay and the other treatment options are you should give insulin that is regular insulin should be given okay and kcl should be given whenever you are giving insulin infusion and if potassium value is less than 5.1 okay that is about your the acute complications chronic complications diabetic nephropathy what is the drug of choice for diabetic nephropathy that is ac inhibitors and what is the earliest manifestation the earliest manifestation will be microalbuminuria and to reduce that microalbuminuria you should give the ac inhibitors then if the question is asked what is the most common type of that is distal symmetrical right distal symmetrical sensory neuropathy hmm? distal symmetrical sensory neuropathy is the most common type of the diabetic neuropathy right and in diabetic neuropathy what will be the presentation there will be tingling numbness paresthesia dysesthesias will be there so for which you give tricyclic antidepressants pregabalin or gabapentin can be given right then diabetic retinopathy you have two types proliferative and non proliferative diabetic retinopathy so proliferative diabetic retinopathy what is the cause of blindness that will be retinal detachment whereas non proliferative diabetic retinopathy what is the cause of blindness the cause of blindness will be macular edema right macular edema then how do you treat this retinal detachment we give laser therapy that is ndyag laser 
hmm? that is ND YAG laser or you need to give intravitreal bevacizumab should be given right intravitreal bevacizumab will be given okay right so that is about your diabetic retinopathy and so this is about your quick complications okay right then yes now some images related to your uh, diabetes meters yes what is this instrument and where do we use this instrument any one of you so this particular instrument any one of you where do we use this instrument this instrument is useful mainly for testing the peripheral neuropathy and what is the name of this particular filament the name of this filament is two side semi swinstein monofilament test right semi swinstein monofilament test that is what is your uh, monofilament test right then this question has been asked repeatedly in the fmg exam what is this sign and in which clinical condition do you come across this this is seen in diabetes mellitus and what is this sign called as this is called prayer sign or another name which is given for this is diabetic chiropathy where the individual will have limited joint mobility where the individual will have limited joint mobility and whenever right whenever you correct that hyperglycemia whenever you correct that hyperglycemia then the individual will be able to approximate both the hands okay right that is about your prayer sign which is also called diabetic chiropathy then next is yeah so in which endocrine disorder you can come across this this is what is nothing but your xanthal asthma xanthal asthma is nothing but yellow yellowish cholesterol rich material where do you have this cholesterol rich material in diabetes mellitus so xanthal asthma you come across this in diabetes mellitus another important image in diabetes mellitus is in which endocrine disorder do you observe this complication this compli what is this it is nothing but neuropathic foot ulcer right it is nothing but neuropathic foot ulcer and you come across this neuropathic foot ulcer in diabetes mellitus and how will you differentiate it from the ischemic ulcer neuropathic foot ulcers they are present over the sole of the foot whereas ischemic ulcer they are present with over the toe or they are present over the medial and lateral malleoli okay so and even the edges there is very clean edges in case of neuropathic ulcer but you don't have that clean edges in case of the uh, ischemic ulcer okay right then next image based question answer this what is the name of this dermatological sign and in which endocrine disorder do you observe this so this you come across in diabetes mellitus and what is this sign this is nothing but necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum hmm? necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum and you come across this mainly over the lower limbs right you come across this mainly over the lower limbs and this is more common in women rather than men and how is the appearance of this necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum it is shiny red brown patches right it is nothing but a shiny red brown patches okay so that is about your necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum now can anyone tell me one more dermatological manifestation in patients with diabetes mellitus any one of you one more important dermatological manifestation that you can come across in patients with diabetes mellitus any one of you quickly yes very good so that is acanthosis nigricans will be there so this acanthosis nigricans right what exactly is this right it is the scenario where there will be the hyperpigmented skin Yeah. I'm sorry, one minute. 
following. Okay. So, yes, so this is about your necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum, right? And finally, you should know about the receptors of the various hormones, okay? So, like this completes the entire endocrinology. So, if you take the nuclear receptors, what are the hormones which are having the nuclear receptors? That the pneumonic is PET. Hmm? The pneumonic is PET. So, what is this PET? Progesterone, estrogen and testosterone. And T3, T4. They have the receptors in the nucleus. And you tell good morning to the cytoplasm. So, which hormones have cytoplasmic receptors? That is glucocorticoids and as well as the mineralocorticoids. Okay. Then membrane receptors, we have tyrosine kinase and G-protein coupled receptors, okay. Is your entire endocrinology, right. Now, let us start with the cardiology now. Let us start with the revision on the cardiology, okay. Just give me a minute, then quickly I will start with the cardiology revision. Yeah, yes, Rachna, I will revise upper and lower motor neuron lesion, Rachna. Just give me a minute, I will revise for you. Uh, yes, Aditya, Telegram channel name is Medicine Made Easy by Dr. Rajesh Gubba. Medicine Made Easy by Dr. Rajesh Gubba is my Telegram channel name. So you will get this PDF with annotations on my telegram channel name, on my telegram channel, okay. Uh, I will send the link, hmm? I will send the link, just give me a minute, I will send the link. Right, so that is my telegram channel, okay. <clears throat> right, so now let us start with the revision of the cardiology, okay. Right. So in cardiology also, we will do the quick revision of the individual topics. So we are done with the endocrinology. So almost like 4 to 5 marks you, have def you are definitely having in your hand right now. So now let us quickly revise the cardiology now. So yes, I will discuss some images. I will also discuss clinical based questions and as well as the quick revision of the entire cardiology. Right. So please tell me, what is the most common cause of right heart failure? Most common cause of right heart failure will be left heart failure. Yeah, uh, yes Vedanta, even I will discuss the ECG as well. Even I will discuss ECG as well, okay. Right. Okay. Now, what is the most common cause of, hmm, most common cause of the acute corpal nail? Most common cause of acute corpal nail will be massive pulmonary embolism. And what is the most common cause of chronic core pulmonary? That will be COPD. And how will you like how will you classify the heart failure? You classify the heart failure mainly based on the ejection fraction. So heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, where the ejection fraction, right, where the ejection fraction will be less than 40%. And heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, where the ejection fraction will be more than 50%. Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, you come across this in patients with the coronary artery disease. And you also come across this in valvular pathologies like aortic regurgitation and as well as the mitral regurgitation. Okay, right. Then, and you take heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, this we call it as the systolic heart failure. Right, this we call it as systolic heart failure. Then you see this heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, where the ejection fraction will be more than 50% and this we call it as diastolic heart failure. Then what are the conditions where you will have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction that you come across in patients with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. 
you will have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction then endomyocardial disorders what are those endomyocardial disorders like endomyocardial fibrosis then what is the earliest feature of left heart failure the earliest feature of left heart failure will be development of paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea what is the earliest feature of right heart failure the earliest feature of right heart failure will be raised jvp or hepatojugular reflex will be positive and the other signs and symptoms if you take in left heart failure you will have the cough with pink frothy expectoration because of pulmonary edema and on examination you will have the additional heart sound s3 and s4 and in right heart failure you will have tender hepatomegaly along with tender hepatomegaly you will also have pedal edema portal hypertension ascites splenomegaly will be there and can anyone tell me what is the name of the criteria for the heart failure yes can anyone tell me what is the name of the criteria for heart failure the name of the criteria for heart failure will be framingham's criteria right name of the criteria will be framingham's criteria then how will you diagnose the heart failure see diagnosis of the heart failure one you can test it by the cardiac biomarkers what are those cardiac biomarkers nt pro bnp atrial natriuretic peptide adrenomedullin endothelin but which is the most sensitive marker the most sensitive marker is nt pro bnp nt pro bnp it is not only diagnostic it is also therapeutic please remember it is not only diagnostic it is also therapeutic and it is also prognostic marker and what is the importance of endothelin the importance of endothelin is it tells you about the vascular resistance right it tells you about the vascular resistance okay so that is about your endothelin okay then what will the chest x ray show chest x ray will show you upper lobe venous distension i'll show you the chest x ray so you see here right you will have the upper lobe venous distension right upper lobe venous distension will be there and then you have the presence of the curly b lines which is nothing but your interstitial edema and you have this characteristic backwing appearance and this backwing appearance you get this mainly because of the alveolar edema okay and finally there will be development of the pleural effusion okay so these are the chest x ray findings that you come across in patients with the congestive heart failure then you should know the characteristic breathing pattern can anyone tell me what is the characteristic breathing pattern in patients with the congestive heart failure characteristic breathing pattern the characteristic breathing pattern in patients with congestive heart failure will be chain stokes respiration <coughs> right it will be chain stokes respiration what is this chain stokes respiration where you will have the irregular breathing pattern where the individual will have increase in the respiratory rate followed by that there will be apnea again there will be increase in the respiratory rate followed by that again there will be apnea so this will be characteristic breathing pattern that you will have in patients with the congestive heart failure then what is the drug of choice for acute pulmonary edema any one of you drug of choice for acute pulmonary edema secondary to left ventricular failure drug of choice for acute pulmonary edema will be furosemide right that will be furosemide okay right and what you have to understand here is if the question is asked like what will be the first line treatment the first line treatment is you need to supplement the oxygen and what is the first line drug that will be furosemide that is mainly to reduce the pulmonary edema and what are the drugs which will improve the mortality in patients with the improve the mortality in the sense the drugs which will reduce the mortality what i mean to say is which will reduce the mortality that will be beta blockers right then ac inhibitors angiotensin receptor blockers then aldosterone antagonist that is pyrrolactone should be given hmm? aldosterone antagonist that is pyrrolactone will be given so this will be the drugs which will reduce the mortality in the patients now in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction what is the drug of choice any one of you heart failure with reduced ejection fraction what is the drug of choice for improving the ejection fraction what is the drug of choice for improving the ejection fraction that will be your arni that is 
angiotensin receptor blocker that is valsartan should be given plus neprilysin inhibitor right neprilysin inhibitor and that neprilysin inhibitor will be secubitril okay so this completes the discussion of important points related to the congestive heart failure now yes this is an important image based question right ecp that is ex enhanced external counter pulsation technique now where do we use this enhanced external counter pulsation this enhanced external counter pulsation is used in refractory cases of the heart failure right in refractory cases of heart failure where the ejection fraction does not improve or where the pulmonary edema does not decrease where the dyspnea does not decrease in spite of medical management then you need to do this ecp enhanced external counter pulsation basically what this will do is it will improve the blood supply to the heart during diastole and thereby it will improve the myocardial contractility now i'll ask you a quick question yes answer this a 56 year old patient with stage d cardiomyopathy comes to you for your second opinion he is already receiving furosemide ace inhibitor beta blocker and spironolactone he has been told by a specialist that he needs a device to avoid dying from irregular heart rhythm what non pharmacological in treatments are available for prevention of sudden cardiac death in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy any one of you yes so once this question is over we are done with the congestive heart failure so like you need to place icd implantable cardioverter defibrillator that will prevent the sudden cardiac death because of vt and vf in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy right in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy please remember these individuals they are at increased risk of vt and vf so how can you uh, decrease that vt and vf by placing icd and that will prevent the sudden cardiac death okay right so we are done with the congestive heart failure now let me revise arterial pulse in just 5 minutes so mainly in the arterial pulse what they will ask you is the abnormal characters of the pulse so first important pulses paradoxes what is that fall in systolic blood pressure more than 10 mm of mercury during inspiration right fall in systolic blood pressure more than 10 mm of mercury during inspiration is called pulses paradoxes and where do you come across this patient in cardiac tamponade and occasionally you come across this even in patients with a constrictive pericarditis and what are the respiratory conditions where you can have this pulses paradoxes you can have this in status asthmaticus right and you can also have this even in severe copd right severe copd okay next coming to pulses bisphereens where you have two peaks in the systole that is what is called pulses bisphereens you come across this in patients with the hocm hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or you will also see this in patients with as with ar and you also come across this even in patients with severe ar you can have this pulses bisphereens where there is two peaks in systole then dicrotic pulse that is one peak in systole and one peak in diastole you see this in patients with the dilated cardiomyopathy next pulses alternance you have alternate weak and strong pulse where do you come across this you come across this in patients with the severe left ventricular failure then pulses bigeminous pulses bigeminous is that you have a strong beat or a strong pulse then a weak pulse followed by that you have a pause you come across this in patients with digoxin toxicity hmm? digoxin toxicity what hammer pulse where there will be rapid upstroke and then collapsing pulse you come across this in patients with aortic regurgitation and even in patients with severe mr then pulses parvus attitardus that is slow rising pulse with late peaking or slow rising pulse with delayed peaking you come across this in patients with the aortic stenosis where you will have pulses parvus attitardus now let me just discuss quick images related to arterial pulse now the, see they'll give you this image and they'll ask you what is the point at which the aortic valve closes the aortic valve closes exactly at this point okay and what do we call this as this we call it as incisura hmm, we call this as incisura at the point of incisura you have aortic valve and as well as pulmonary valve closure 
and next important thing the image that they can ask you is about the water hammer pulse what should be the position of the hand when you are examining for the water hammer pulse so this should be the position of the hand when you are examining the arterial pulse of water hammer type okay and they can give you this image and they will ask you what characteristic pulse it is so you see here during inspiration the systolic blood pressure is reducing more than 10 millimeters of mercury so this is suggestive of pulses paradoxes then next important image that can be asked related to arterial pulse is pulses bisphereens just now we have discussed you come across this in hocm where you have two peaks in systole that is called pulses bisphereens then next another important image related to dichroic pulse what did we discuss one peak you have in systole and one peak you have it in diastole and you come across this in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy then other important image is related to pulses alternance so one strong and one weak beat that is called pulses alternance you come across this in patients with severe left ventricular failure in severe left ventricular failure next is the pulses bigeminous what is this you have a strong beat you have a weak beat and then you have a compensatory pause where do you come across this in patients with the digoxin toxicity right now i will show you a question please answer this a 78 year old woman is admitted with heart failure the underlying cause is determined to be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy what is the most likely sign which is being present in this patient anyone very good not pulses bigeminous not pulses bigeminous in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy what did i tell you it is bisphereens pulse pulses bigeminous you come across this in digoxin toxicity hmm? you come across this in digoxin toxicity pulses bigeminous okay right so that was about your arterial pulse okay and the next important quick discussion is about the jvp so in the jvp you have the following waves acx vy so a wave is due to what the atrial contraction where it is a positive wave where the pressure within the atria increases c wave is due to what that is due to bulging of the cusp into right atria that is tricuspid valve it bulges into right atria during rv systole that will give you c wave x wave is a negative wave where the pressure within the atria decreases and you come across, that x wave is due to atrial relaxation then v wave so v wave is what it is a positive wave where the pressure within the atria increases and that is due to venous filling that is due to venous filling then you have y wave so y wave is what it is a negative wave where the pressure within the atria decreases and why is that due to that is due to atrial emptying now what is that they will ask you related to jvp is the abnormalities of the jvp is what they will ask you okay right yes you tell me quickly now a wave is absent where do you have this a wave being absent in atrial fibrillation where do you have giant a wave that is right ventricular inflow obstruction or right ventricular outflow obstruction so that is in case of tricuspid stenosis and right atrial myxoma and right ventricular outflow tract obstruction that is pulmonary stenosis and pulmonary hypertension canon a wave you come across this mainly in case of av block and which type of av block that is complete heart block okay where there will be complete av nodal block okay and next is you also come across this in patients with a junctional tachycardia even in junctional tachycardia you can have this canon a wave coming to abnormalities related to the x wave what is the condition where you have reversal of the x wave normally x wave is a negative wave reversal of x wave you come across this in patients with the tricuspid regurgitation then what is the conditions where you have the accentuated s wave x wave accentuated x wave you have that in constrictive pericarditis you have that in patients with <clears throat> cardiac tamponade and you have this in patients with the restrictive cardiomyopathy okay next abnormalities of v wave so what is the condition where the v wave is increased okay so v wave is increased in patients with tricuspid regurgitation then abnormalities of y wave what is the condition where the y wave is absent 
that is in patients with cardiac tamponade. What is the condition where you have deep Y descent? You have that in constrictive pericarditis and restrictive cardiomyopathy. What is the condition where you have early Y descent? Early Y descent, you have that in patients with tricuspid regurgitation. What is the condition where you have slow Y descent that you have in tricuspid stenosis? Okay, so these are the quick pointers, right? Quick pointers related to the JVP. Okay, right. Then, then they can ask you even the images also, right? So this is a normal JVP. Hmm, this is the normal JVP. And you take in cardiac tamponade, what did I tell you? There will be accentuated X wave and Y wave will be absent. You see here, the Y wave, this is a Y wave. But in case of cardiac tamponade, the Y wave is absent. And in constrictive pericarditis, what did we discuss? There will be deep X wave and there will be also deep Y wave. Right, there will be deep X and as well as Y wave. That is what you will have in patients with the constrictive pericarditis. So images, image based questions in JVP can also be asked. Then these two are the important images, right? So that completes the discussion of your JVP. Okay, right. Then coming to another important topic, cardiac murmurs. Five minutes cardiac murmurs. So cardiac murmurs, if you see, what is the condition where you will have the continuous murmur? Very important conditions are PDA, patent ductus arteriosus, which we call it as Gibson's murmur or missionary murmur. Then ruptured sinus of Valsalva, continuous murmur will be there. AV fistula, continuous murmur will be there. Either coronary AV fistula or systemic AV fistula, you will have the continuous murmurs. Okay, right. And uh, the other one is mammary sofal in pregnancy. Mammary softal in pregnancy. That is also a continuous murmur, but that is a physiological murmur. Next, what are the conditions where you will have the early systolic murmurs? Let me discuss about the systolic murmurs now. Early systolic murmurs, you come across this in acute MR, acute TR, and small VSD. You will have early systolic murmurs. Then, mid or ejection systolic murmur. You have this in aortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, and hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, where you have mid or ejection systolic murmur. Late systolic murmur, you have this in mitral valve prolapse syndrome and tricuspid valve prolapse syndrome. Then coming to diastolic murmurs. Early diastolic murmur, you have this in aortic regurgitation and as well as the pulmonary regurgitation. Mid diastolic murmur, in mitral stenosis and then tricuspid stenosis. Late diastolic murmurs, you take this caricoms murmur. Caricoms murmur is actually a mid diastolic murmur, but occasionally the murmur can progress even to the later part of the diastole. So, <clears throat> caricoms murmur, it is mid to late diastolic murmur. And even Austin Flynn murmur, which is seen in aortic regurgitation, that is also a mid diastolic murmur but that can progress even to the later part of the diastole, okay? So mid to late diastolic murmur will be your caricoms murmur and Austin Flynn murmur. The next is D. Carvalho's sign. Can anyone tell me what is D. Carvalho's sign? Yes, what is D. Carvalho's sign? So D. Carvalho's sign is that where there will be increase in the right-sided murmurs. Hmm? Increase in right-sided murmurs upon inspiration is what is called as the D. Carvalho sign. Okay, next. I'll show you one important clinical scenario, please. So this was about the murmurs. Okay, just five minutes, entire murmurs are over. Right. So 60-year-old man presents with progressive symmetrical lower extremity edema. Which of the following finding would be inconsistent with the diagnosis of right-sided heart failure? Which of the following would be inconsistent with the diagnosis of right-sided heart failure? Any one of you? So which of the murmur, sorry, which of the following, uh, what is it inconsistent with right-sided heart failure? That will be your pulses paradoxes. Hmm? That will be pulses paradoxes. There will be increased bilirubin level, that is correct. Diarrhea can be there in right-sided heart failure, correct. Pro prolonged prothrombin time will be there and even Kussmaul sign also will be there. So what is Kussmaul sign now? 
whose small sign is jugular venous distension right jugular venous distension on inspiration normally what will happen to jugular vein the jugular vein volume reduces on inspiration but when the jugular venous distension happens on inspiration that we call it as the kusmal sign okay right and why there will be elevated bilirubin and as well as prothrombin time in right sided heart failure that is because of the hepatic congestion now sometimes they may ask you sometimes they may ask you the image based questions on the murmurs okay so what is this this is continuous murmur where the murmur will start at around s1 then progress up to s2 and then continues up to s1 again so throughout the cardiac cycle you have the murmur that is called continuous murmur then pan systolic murmur pan systolic murmur is what throughout the systole that is between s1 and s2 you have a murmur that is called pan systolic murmur where do you come across this in mr tr and as well as vsd right mr tr and vsd okay pan systolic murmur then what is the condition you see here a mid systolic click with late systolic murmur where do you come across this mid systolic click with late systolic murmur you come across this in mitral valve prolapse syndrome and tricuspid valve prolapse syndrome okay right then followed by that yes they'll just give you this image and they'll try to ask you to identify what is the type of murmur so if you see the, where is the peaking of the murmur the peaking of the murmur is there exactly in the mid part of the systole so this we call it as ejection systolic murmur or mid systolic murmur and where do you come across this in aortic stenosis pulmonary stenosis and hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy right so that was about your the cardiac murmurs yes answer this a 75 year old man is brought to the casualty with sudden syncopal episodes while playing with his grandchildren okay he is currently alert and describes occasional substernal heaviness and shortness of breath his lungs have bibasilar rals and blood pressure is 120 by 80 what is the classical finding expected in this patient what is the classical finding expected in this patient any one of you yes so the classical finding which is expected so what is the diagnosis very good rain diagnosis is aortic stenosis right because elderly patients aortic stenosis is very common then there is syncopal episode which is feature of your aortic stenosis there is substernal heaviness angina that is also feature of the aortic stenosis shortness of breath dyspnea that is also feature of aortic stenosis so this in this individual there will be harsh ejection systolic murmur right with soft s2 or soft a2 and that is about your as yes named murmurs is another important condition another very very important question that they will be asking you so carry coombs murmur where do you come across this you come across this in acute rheumatic fever where there is development of acute mr okay you come across this in acute rheumatic fever where there will be development of acute mr carry coombs murmur then austin flynn murmur where do you come across austin flynn murmur that is in case of the aortic regurgitation then where do you come across this gram steels murmur that is in patients with pulmonary hypertension causing pulmonary regurgitation and this is basically an early diastolic murmur okay it's an early diastolic murmur which one the gram steels murmur whereas carikums murmur and uh, austin flynn murmur both of them they are mid diastolic murmurs then gibson's murmur gibson's murmur you will have that in patent ductus arteriosus and what type of murmur is this this is a continuous murmur okay right then retents murmur retents murmur you have this in av block and this is a diastolic murmur okay then dox murmur dox murmur you get you come across this in left anterior descending artery stenosis and what murmur is this this is also a diastolic murmur next is mill wheel murmur will mill wheel murmur you come across this in air emboli air emboli you come across this mill wheel murmur gallivardin phenomenon where do you see this aortic stenosis the murmur of aortic stenosis from the aortic area if it radiates to the apex that is called gallivardin phenomenon okay then col cecil murmur you come across this in aortic regurgitation the murmur of aortic regurgitation the murmur of aortic regurgitation if it is radiating to the axilla that is called the col cecil murmur 
then coming to cruel hair bomb got and murmur cruel hair bomb got and murmur you come across this in patients with portal hypertension okay next finally mean slur man scratch mean slur man scratch you come across this in thyrotoxicosis okay so these are the named murmurs that you need to know right so we are done with the murmurs now then next 5 minutes on the topic of the heart sounds okay so you should know the areas of auscultation what are all the various areas of auscultation like aortic area which is present in the second right intercostal space parasternal line then what is this b b suggest you of your pulmonary area and this is present in the second right sorry second left intercostal space hmm, second left intercostal space the parasternal line and what is this point c point c suggest you of the herbs point and this herbs point is present in third left intercostal space hmm, third left intercostal space parasternal line and what is this point b that will be tricuspid area and this tricuspid area it is present in fourth or fifth left intercostal space parasternal line that will be the tricuspid area and then finally mitral area where will be the mitral area mitral area it corresponds to the apex now the question that i'll be asking for you is where will be the gibson's area anyone hmm? where will be the gibson's area anyone of you i want this one to be answered by you where will be the gibson's area so please remember gibson's area is the one which is useful for auscultating gibson's murmur and that is present in the first left intercostal space right that is present in the first left intercostal space parasternal area okay first left intercostal space parasternal area okay then coming to the quick recap of all the heart sounds so first heart sound you will listen that during isovolumetric contraction phase and what are the conditions where you will have loud s1 loud s1 you come across this in patients with mitral stenosis tricuspid stenosis in individuals with short pr interval and all the conditions wherever there is tachycardia you will have loud s1 what are the conditions where you will have soft s1 the conditions where there is long pr interval right and in patients with pericardial effusion and in patients with left sided pleural effusion you will have soft first heart sound and not only that even in patients with calcified mitral stenosis and calcified tricuspid stenosis also you have the softest one okay then coming to the second heart sound second heart sound you hear this during isovolumetric relaxation phase or some books give you the proto diastole right and what are the conditions where you will have wide split s2 the conditions where you will have wide split s2 it is due to early a2 or delayed p2 early a2 where do you have this early a2 early a2 you can come across this in mr and as well as vsd where do you have delayed p2 delayed p2 you can have this in patients with right bundle branch block you can have this in patients with lv ectopic beat you can have this in patients with pulmonary stenosis you can have this in patients with pulmonary hypertension and you come across this in patients with the pulmonary embolism so either due to early a2 or delayed p2 there will be wide split s2 then what are the conditions where there will be reversed split s2 reversed split s2 you come across this in left bundle branch block where there will be p2 followed by that a2 and you come across the same thing even in severe aortic stenosis okay then what are the conditions where you will have wide fixed split why you come across this in patients with the aortic stenosis sorry i am very sorry wide fixed split you come across this in asd atrial septal defect you will have this right wide fixed split you come across this in asd atrial septal defect then coming to s3 where do you when will you listen this s3 your s3 it is being heard in the first rapid filling hmm? s3 is being heard in the first rapid filling 
and where do you listen this physiological S3? The physiological S3, you listen that in children. Physiological S3, you listen that in pregnancy. Physiological S3, you listen that in athletes. What are the conditions where you will have pathological S3? Pathological S3, you will come across this in right ventricular dysfunction, left ventricular dysfunction, and you come across this in all the patients with cardiomyopathies, like dilated cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy, and even hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can have this, the pathological S3. Okay, right. Then, yeah, and that pathological S3, we call it as ventricular yellow. Then, S4. In which conditions you will, and which phase of cardiac cycle you will listen S4? That is during second rapid filling. Right, that is during second rapid filling. Okay, and that is due to atrial contraction. And you will listen this S4 in patients with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. You will listen this in aortic stenosis. You will listen this in pulmonary stenosis. Okay, so these are the, and you can also listen this in patients with myocardial infarction. So these are all the abnormalities of the heart sounds. Okay, so complete heart sounds just in five minutes. Okay, right. Then uh, class will be up until I will take another one hour. Hmm? Yes, Dr. Bean, I will take the class for another one hour. I will finish cardiology and then I will wind up this session. Okay, right. Yes, semilunar valve closure is represented by semilunar valve closure is represented by any one of you. Semilunar valve closure, if you take options A, B, C, D, right, semilunar valve closure, please remember it corresponds to what it corresponds to incisura. Okay, that is your point C. Yes, uh, Abhishek. Uh, you can get this PDF on the, my telegram channel or another telegram channel. I will post the same PDF. Okay. Right. Okay. So this is where your semilunar valves are being closed. Now regarding the heart sounds, you should know some additional heart sounds. What are the conditions where you will have these additional heart sounds? One of the additional heart sound is opening snap. Opening snap, you will listen that in mitral stenosis. Pericardial knock, you will listen this in patients with the constrictive pericarditis. Tumor plop, you will listen this in patients with the myxoma. Ejection click, you will listen this in patients with aortic stenosis and as well as the pulmonary stenosis. And among all these, which is the, which are all your diastolic sounds? So your opening snap is a diastolic sound. Pericardial knock is also a diastolic sound. Tumor plop is also a diastolic sound. Ejection click is the only one which is the systolic sound. Ejection click is the only one which is the systolic sound. Then, which is the high-pitched sounds, which are the low-pitched sounds. Okay, so opening snap, high-pitched sound. Pericardial knock, high-pitched sound. Tumor plop, low-pitched sound. Ejection click, high-pitched sound. Okay, so these are the important points related to the additional heart sounds. So, we are done with the topics like congestive heart failure, arterial pulse, JVP, cardiac murmurs and heart sounds. Done. Now, we will move on to the discussion related to the cardiomyopathies. Hmm? Discussion related to cardiomyopathies. So, what is the most common form of cardiomyopathy? Most common form of cardiomyopathy will be dilated cardiomyopathy. Five minutes dilated cardiomyopathy will be over. Okay, right. So, in dilated cardiomyopathy, what type of heart failure is this? It is a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which is nothing but it's a systolic heart failure. Okay, where the ejection fraction will be less than 40%. Hmm? Ejection fraction will be less than 40%. Okay, right. And what is the most common toxin that will be responsible for your dilated cardiomyopathy? That is alcohol. Alcohol is the most common toxin. Then what are the other drugs? See, drug abuse that can cause dilated cardiomyopathy will be cooking. And we have some chemotherapeutic drugs. What are those chemotherapeutic drugs? That chemotherapeutic drugs include the adriamycin, then cyclophosphamide. Adriamycin and cyclophosphamide. Next, nutritional disorders. Nutritional disorders include B1 deficiency and as well as the selenium deficiency. B1 deficiency and selenium deficiency. Okay. Then what are the endocrine disorders? 
endocrine disorders are diabetes mellitus and then thyroid disorders what thyroid disorders both hypothyroidism and as well as the hyperthyroidism then what are the neurological conditions that will cause dilated cardiomyopathy that mainly include the muscular dystrophy what is that duchenne's muscular dystrophy dmd and frederick's ataxia both of them they will have dilated cardiomyopathy then what will be the clinical features clinical features will be similar to that of the heart failure you don't have any additional feature only additional features that you can have is there can be thromboembolic events right thromboembolic events and what will be the signs you will have s3 and s4 apart from the additional s1 and s2 apart from s1 and s2 you will have additional s3 and as well as s4 and you will have functional mr and functional tr it is not your true mr and true tr it is functional mr and functional tr chest x ray will show you cardiomegaly now can anyone tell me to call it as cardiomegaly what should be cardiothoracic ratio what should be cardiothoracic ratio to call it as cardiomegaly anyone so to call it as cardiomegaly the cardiothoracic ratio it should be more than 0.5 on the chest x ray uh, gopalan mo more than 0.6 to call it as cardiomegaly that is in neonates in neonates more than 0.6 whereas in adults it should be more than 0.5 okay right now coming to cardiac biomarkers so that is nt pro bnp will be elevated because the individual is landing up in heart failure and what is the purpose of doing 2d echo 2d echo will show you that there are dilated chambers and when you calculate the ejection fraction you will notice that there is decreased ejection fraction you will notice that there is decreased ejection fraction <clears throat> right and what is the treatment treatment is similar to that of heart failure you need to give uh, diuretics beta blockers ace inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers and spironolactone all these can be given and what are the drugs that should be avoided in dilated cardiomyopathy calcium channel blockers should be avoided and why we should give anticoagulants that is mainly to reduce the thromboembolic events because these individuals are at increased risk of thromboembolic events so to reduce that we need to give anticoagulants and what is the intervention that you will be doing is crt cardiac resynchronization therapy that is mainly to increase the ejection fraction but when will you do this cardiac resynchronization therapy only when the individual is refractory to medical management that is the point when we do this crt cardiac resynchronization therapy okay right can anyone identify this image this can be asked as image based question Hmm, this can be asked as an image based question can anyone identify this image <clears throat> yes okay so if you see this image this is the image very good medical doctor this is crt cardiac resynchronization therapy so cardiac resynchronization therapy you have three leads one lead is in right atrium the other lead is in the right rv apex and the other lead is in the lateral wall of left ventricle right it is present in the lateral wall of left ventricle okay this is what is your cardiac resynchronization therapy which is useful for improving the synchrony and thereby increasing the ejection fraction in the patient and what is the indication for crt indication for CRT is it is not all the patients we place the crt it should be dilated cardiomyopathy with wide qrs complex and how much should be that qrs complex more than 120 milliseconds <laughs> okay then only you should place crt otherwise no if there is narrow qrs complex then don't place crt then so this will be the 2d echo finding of dilated cardiomyopathy where you have the dilated chambers where you have this dilated chambers and ejection fraction also will be reduced now this will be the chest x ray of cardiomegaly in case of your uh, dilated cardiomyopathy and how much will be the cardiothoracic ratio that will be more than 0.5 more than 0.5 and sometimes they can also give you chest x ray of cardio cardiac resynchronization therapy so they'll give you this chest x ray and identify what is the uh, instrument which is there so you have to tell it as crt so why are is why is that you are telling it as crt you see here you have one lead is in the right atrium the other lead is in the 
right ventricle and the other lead is in the lateral wall of the left ventricle okay so this is not your pacemaker this is your crt so i'll just zoom it and show you again so you can see this white color number one this is another white color number two and this is another white color number three which is present in the lateral wall of the left ventricle okay right so that is about your dilated cardiomyopathy right and we have one more form of dilated cardiomyopathy which is nothing but your taco subo why is it called taco subo cardiomyopathy that is because the apex of the heart it is abnormally dilated and the apex of the heart which is like abnormally dilated what is the shape of this apex it is similar to that of a taco subo which is used in japan to catch the octopus and that is nothing but that is the reason why it is called taco subo cardiomyopathy and another name for it is it is also called apical apical cardiomyopathy why because it is the apex of the heart which has been abnormally ballooned out okay and it is also called stress cardiomyopathy because the very important pathogenesis for development of taco subo cardiomyopathy is excessive stress right excessive stress so and this is also called broken heart syndrome right and why is it called broken heart syndrome that is because the apex which is ballooned out it can get easily ruptured so that is the reason why it is called the broken heart syndrome and what is the name of the criteria for your taco subo cardiomyopathy that is modified mayo's criteria so ecg it will be showing st segment elevation right troponin levels will be elevated 2d echo there will be apical hypokinesia right there will be apical hypokinesia within the 2d echo coronary angiogram will be absolutely normal and there should be absence of pheochromocytoma okay because what is the main pathogenesis excessive stress okay and in excessive stress there is massive release of catecholamines and that is what is responsible for your apical cardiomyopathy and if it is pheochromocytoma then it will not be your taco subo cardiomyopathy you should rule out pheochromocytoma so these four out of four should be there for diagnosing your taco subo cardiomyopathy and treatment what we give is aspirin we also give beta blockers and we also give ac inhibitors but only thing when you are giving ac inhibitors and beta blockers you should ensure that the blood pressure should be more than 90 mm of mercury okay next question a multi paras para 3 li 3 young lady who delivered normally 3 weeks ago suddenly developed dyspnea with cardiac failure she has no history of cardiac disease before or during pregnancy and had tachycardia and peripheral edema hemoglobin 9 ejection fraction 35% which of the following is the most likely diagnosis yes which of the following very good so this is nothing but your peripartum cardiomyopathy so to call it as peripartum cardiomyopathy when should be the development of dilated cardiomyopathy in uh, the pregnancy so that is during last month of pregnancy or after sorry or within 6 months of delivery right within 6 months of delivery if there is development of dilated cardiomyopathy that we call it as peripartum cardiomyopathy and what is the criteria very very important criteria that is ejection fraction should be less than 40% and another very very important criteria is absence of the pre existing cardiac disease okay so before the pregnancy or during the pregnancy there should not be any other cardiac disease right and you should know the risk factors for development of peripartum cardiomyopathy risk factors for peripartum cardiomyopathy includes preeclampsia right and then multiparous females right multiparous females and elderly females okay so these are the risk factors for the development of the peripartum cardiomyopathy right next how do you treat these patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy you should give beta blockers and which particular beta blocker is very much acceptable that is sotalol okay sotalol is acceptable uh, mainly to prevent the development of arrhythmias and all and very important is you should also give bromocriptin why you should give bromocriptin in patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy why because it has been found that the broken fragments of prolactin are responsible for the development of peripartum cardiomyopathy so you reduce the prolactin secretion how can you reduce the prolactin secretion by giving bromocriptin okay so this will be the treatment for your peripartum cardiomyopathy and that finishes your dilated cardiomyopathy right next next type of cardiomyopathy will be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy yes can anyone tell me 
how will be the ejection fraction in uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy so to call it as a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy you should know like you should know how much should be the hypertrophy of the lv wall the lv wall it should be hypertrophy of by more than 1.5 cm then only we use the word hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and ejection fraction it is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction it is diastolic heart failure where ejection fraction will be more than 50% what is the pathogenesis now because it's a preserved ejection fraction it is diastolic dysfunction hmm? diastolic dysfunction is the pathogenesis now this hypertrophy can occur at two places either it can be septal hypertrophy or it can be apical hypertrophy and if it is septal hypertrophy what will be the shape of the lv lumen it is banana shaped lv lumen and if it is apical hypertrophy what is the shape of lv lumen it is the ace of spades i'll show you both the images and what is the most common gene which is being defective it is the beta myosin gene and this beta myosin gene it is present on which chromosome it is present on chromosome 14 what type of inheritance is this autosomal dominant type of inheritance what are the other proteins which are being defective myosin binding protein c and troponin t <laughs> right myosin binding protein c and troponin t okay right then what is the most common symptom most commonly they present with sudden cardiac death they remain asymptomatic and they present with sudden cardiac death on exertion but if at all if the individual is symptomatic the symptoms the most common symptom will be dyspnea and there can be even syncopal attack those patients who are having syncopal attack they are at increased risk of sudden cardiac death they are at increased risk of sudden cardiac death then how will be the carotid so carotids if you see there will be double carotid upstroke right there will be double carotid upstroke how will be the apical impulse there will be double apical impulse okay right and coming to the heart sounds so how will be the heart sounds along with s1 and s2 there will be also s4 there is an additional heart sound s4 there is atrial gallop will be there and murmur will be ejection systolic murmur or mid systolic murmur okay murmur will be ejection systolic murmur or mid systolic murmur which is a diamond shaped murmur and what will the ecg show ecg will show you that there is features of left ventricular hypertrophy and 2d echo will calculate okay so ecg will show you left ventricular hypertrophy 2d echo will calculate ejection fraction and it will show you that it is a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction then what is the importance of exercise testing in patients with any individual when he do the exercise the systolic blood pressure should increase more than 20 millimeters of mercury upon doing exercise right and upon doing exercise if the systolic blood pressure is not increasing more than 20 millimeters of mercury in a case of hocm then these patients are at increased risk of sudden cardiac death okay in a normal individual it should increase more than 20 if it is not increasing more than 20 in a patient with hocm then that patient is at increased risk of sudden cardiac death then what is the drug of choice drug of choice will be beta blockers that is propranolol should be given and you should also advise avoidance of exertional activity another alternative drug is what that is calcium channel blockers that is diltiazem and verapamil can be given and what is the intervention that can be done in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy the intervention that we do in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will be alcohol rectal ablation right alcohol septal ablation okay that is the intervention that you will be doing or you should do surgical myomectomy right surgical myomectomy okay so this will be the intervention that you will be doing in these patients with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy okay so right that is done so five minutes your hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is over right now see this is what is your septal hypertrophy hmm? this is what is your septal hypertrophy so in septal hypertrophy what is that uh, shape of the ventricle that is banana shaped left ventricle will be there and another form of hypertrophy is what that is the apical hypertrophy so in apical hypertrophy the shape of the lv will be ace of spades hmm? that will be the ace of spades okay right 
and this is the ecg in patients with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where there will be left vent feature suggest you of left ventricular hypertrophy sokolovion criteria will be more than 35 mm and you have this q waves you have this deep dagger shaped q waves right you have deep dagger shaped q waves okay so you have that mainly in the precordial leads that is v5 and as well as v6 and you also have this in 23 abf where you have deep dagger shaped q waves so that will be about the ecg that you will have in patients with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and i will show you one question and let me see how many of you answer this 25 year old footballer is elbowed in the chest by rival defender during the ball possession following the chest trauma the player collapses and dies the most probable cause of death is right most probable cause of death is right very good so it is not hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy it is coma shock cardis right so what is this coma shock cardis coma shock cardis is no, nothing but giving a blunt injury over the heart when the individual is under undergoing some exertional activity causing sudden death that is called coma shock cardis i'll repeat again coma shock cardis is the individual acquiring a blunt injury over the heart and when the individual is doing exertional activity resulting in collapse and death that is what is called as the coma shock cardis okay right next so that was about your story of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy then we move on to the last that is the rarest form of cardiomyopathy that is the restrictive cardiomyopathy so restrictive cardiomyopathy it is the rare form of cardiomyopathy and how much will be the ejection fraction in these patients with restrictive cardiomyopathy that will be around 40 to 50% or it may be even normal as well so it may be slightly reduced or it may be normal as well now what is the most common cause of restrictive cardiomyopathy can anyone answer this most common cause of restrictive cardiomyopathy will be amyloidosis and what type of amyloidosis the most common form of amyloidosis that is causing restrictive cardiomyopathy will be al type of amyloidosis that is nothing but light chain type of amyloidosis and what is the treatment that you should be giving in case of al type of amyloidosis the treatment is you should give alkylator based chemotherapy or high dose melphalon should be given okay alkylator based chemotherapy or high dose melphalon should be given and this is followed by autologous right this is followed by autologous stem cell transplantation right followed by autologous stem cell transplantation then followed by that we have another form of amyloidosis which can cause restrictive cardiomyopathy that is attr attr is nothing but mutated transthyretin that is seen in familial amyloidosis even that can cause restrictive cardiomyopathy and what is the treatment for attr type of amyloidosis causing restrictive cardiomyopathy that will be tafamidis right that will be tafamidis okay then whereas you take a type of amyloidosis a type of amyloidosis that rarely causes a cardiac disease then what are the other causes for your restrictive cardiomyopathy the other causes it includes radiation heart disease right that includes radiation heart disease or myocardial fibrosis okay and then you have many other conditions sarcoidosis hemochromatosis carcinoid syndrome scleroderma leiffler syndrome glycogen deposits all these can cause the restrictive cardiomyopathy but this febris disease is a important multiple choice question what is this febris disease it is basically a lysosomal storage disorder right it is a lysosomal storage disorder okay and why is, how does this febris cause restrictive cardiomyopathy and how does what is the problem in febris it is mainly due to the enzymatic deficiency and what is that enzyme which is defective or which is uh, absent in febris that is alpha galactosidase a right alpha galactosidase a enzyme is being deficient okay yes uh, ali azhar कोमोशो इन हिंदी वंस अगेन आई टेल यू सी कोमोशो कॉर्डिस पेशेंट्स का प्रॉब्लम क्या होगा 
अगर पेशेंट इज डूइंग सम पेशेंट कुछ एक्सर्शनल एक्टिविटी कर रहे लाइक फुटबॉल प्ले कर रहे राइट वो एक्सर्शनल एक्टिविटी पेशेंट को लाइक like आपने एक ब्लंट इंजुरी दिया है हार्ट के ऊपर एक ब्लंट इंजुरी दिया राइट एंड ब्लंट इंजुरी के वजह से वो एक्सर्शनल हार्ट विल डेवलप वीटी एंड वी एफ एंड दे डेवलप सडन कार्डिया डेथ दैट इज कॉल्ड कोमोशो कॉडिस यस अली अजद इज दैट क्लियर ओके now what is a pathology in the restrictive cardiomyopathy pathology in restrictive cardiomyopathy will be diastolic dysfunction pathology will be diastolic dysfunction then what are the clinical features in restrictive cardiomyopathy clinical features will be similar to that of the heart failure hmm, similar to that of heart failure and there will be also thromboembolic events right thromboembolic events okay because these patients they also develop atrial fibrillation and because of which there will be also palpitations as well what is a very very important discussion in the restrictive cardiomyopathy that you should know is about the jvp so in jvp in restrictive cardiomyopathy there will be deep x and y descent and there will be also kusmal sign which is being present kusmal sign is also present in patients with a restrictive cardiomyopathy and next you have s1 and s2 the heart zones which are being heard. then 2d echo if you observe 2d echo will show you that okay i'll show you the 2d echo in restrictive cardiomyopathy this is what is the 2d echo in restrictive cardiomyopathy so what is that you will notice you will notice that there is atrial distension right you will notice that there is atrial distension atria is distended because ventricle is not in a position to receive the blood right and not only that in patients with amyloidosis you can you get this characteristic speckled pattern right in amyloidosis you get this characteristic speckled pattern okay yes sai chand i'll send you this pdf immediately after the class either in my telegram channel that is uh, medicine made easy by dr rajesh gubba or i'll send you it on an academy telegram channel okay right then this will be the echocardiography and endomyocardial biopsy this will be the investigation of choice why it is investigation of choice because you will be able to make out what is the etiology what is the etiology for development of restrictive cardiomyopathy because there are many etiologies amyloidosis radiation myocardial fibrosis sarcoidosis hemochromatosis carcinoid syndrome scleroderma leiffler syndrome glycogen deposits all these can cause restrictive cardiomyopathy so you will be able to make out that by endomyocardial biopsy okay then how do you treat these patients see treatment is similar to that of heart failure we give beta blockers then we give ac inhibitors okay then we also need to give anticoagulants because these individuals are at increase at risk of the thromboembolic events and what is the drug that should be avoided digoxin should be con digoxin is contraindicated why because this digoxin may precipitate arrhythmias that is the reason why digoxin should not be given the remaining all drugs like beta blockers ac inhibitors and or angiotensin receptor blockers uh, aldosterone antagonist all that can be given and one more important drug is the corticosteroids but when will you give this corticosteroids you will be giving this corticosteroids only if the restrictive cardiomyopathy is secondary to sarcoidosis okay corticosteroids may be helpful in sarcoidosis okay right so that is about your the detailed discussion related to the restrictive cardiomyopathy right okay now this is one of the important image based question that can be asked in the restrictive cardiomyopathy yes you see this hmm? so this is a patient with restrictive cardiomyopathy and that to sarcoid heart hmm? that to sarcoid heart so how can you identify that this individual is having sarcoidosis you can see the skin of the individual it is like completely a puckered skin hmm? it is completely a puckered skin and the individual is having microstomia right the individual is unable to open the mouth so that is what is your sarcoidosis theek hai right and in sarcoidosis sorry in restrictive cardiomyopathy you should know the ecg changes ecg there will be low voltage complexes where in the chest leads the qrs complexes will be amplitude will be less than 10 mm whereas in the limb leads the amplitude will be less than 5 mm 
okay less than 5 mm in the limb leads less than 10 mm in the chest leads okay so that is about your restrictive cardiomyopathy now yes a quick question quick clinical based question a 34 year old male experiences shortness of breath with minimal exertion physical examination reveals elevated jugular venous pressure markedly worse with inspiration and two plus lower extremity pitting edema labs are normal cardiac biopsy reveal apple green bidifringence with congo red staining testing reveals mutation in which particular gene yes now ali azar lupus perniome like uh, you will have that purple color purple blue color will be there in uh, lupus pernio okay right no 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 it is not beta myosin why you people are going to beta myosin so where will you have this apple green bifringence in the cardiac biopsy with con congo red staining you will have that in amyloidosis right so in amyloidosis what is the mutation which particular gene is being mutated very good shubham prasad the answer is transthyretin hmm? the answer is transthyretin okay right so that is about the story related to your restrictive cardiomyopathy and as well as the amyloidosis now so that was about your cardiomyopathies 15 minutes we have revised the entire cardiomyopathies now coming to pericardial disorders hmm? coming to pericardial disorders acute pericarditis so this takes only 3 minutes only 3 minutes acute pericarditis will be over so what is the most common cause of the acute pericarditis that is mainly the viral infection and which particular viral infection that is coxsackie a and b virus that will be the most common cause and you have other viruses also like eco virus and all but that will be the next and what are the other causes apart from this you even you have bacterial infections bacterial infections like streptococcus pneumonia then staphylococcus aureus and these are the other causes fungal infections fungal infections like histoplasmosis then blastomycosis okay these are the other causes for the development of acute pericarditis right then even uremia malignancies like hodgkin's lymphoma all these can cause your acute pericarditis now what is the diagnostic triad in case of the acute pericarditis the individual will have chest pain that to pleuritic type of chest pain and where the pain increases upon inspiration the pain increases upon inspiration then there will be pericardial rub on auscultation and ecg will be showing the changes in ecg will be showing the changes what will be the ecg changes in case of acute pericarditis there will be st segment elevation in all the leads except avr so in avr you have st segment depression then what will happen to pr segment pr segment will be depressed except in avr in avr you have pr segment elevation in avr pr segment elevation okay yeah yes ali azad और एक दो सेशंस लेता हूं मैं और एक दो सेशंस लेता हूं ताकि पूरा सब्जेक्ट पूरा टॉपिक्स कंप्लीट करता हूं मैं सो डोंट वरी अबाउट इट ठीक है राइट सो दिस विल बी द ईसीजी चेंजेस देन व्हाट इज द ट्रीटमेंट यू नीड टू गिव एंटी इन्फ्लेमेटरी ड्रग्स दैट इज यू नीड टू गिव एनएसएड्स राइट यू नीड टू गिव द एनएसएड्स देन यू शुड नो व्हाट आर द कॉम्प्लिकेशंस इन पेशेंट्स विद द एक्यूट पेरिकार्डाइटिस कॉम्प्लिकेशंस इज दीस पेशेंट्स दे कैन डेवलप द अर्दिमियस and that to atrial arrhythmias that is in the form of atrial fibrillation there can be pericardial effusion there can be development of cardiac tamponade as well okay so these are the complications of acute pericarditis and with this your acute pericarditis is over and this is the image of acute pericarditis okay so you can see that st segment elevation is there in all the leads hmm? that is present in all the leads except your avr in avr you have st segment depre depression and the other thing is you have pr segment depression and pr segment elevation will be there in avr right in pericarditis you don't have much changes in the jvp uh, acute pericarditis sachin you will have jvp changes in chronic uh, sorry constrictive pericarditis not in acute pericarditis yes sachin is that clear in constrictive pericarditis you have deep x and y descent but not in acute pericarditis what we are discussing is acute pericarditis here okay right then yes so we are done with the pericarditis now we will discuss the effusions okay so how pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade so what should be the normal pericardial fluid 
normal pericardial fluid is around 20 to 30 ml. When will you call pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade? When the quantity of the fluid is more than 50 ml, we call it as pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade. But what will be the difference in between these two, between your pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade? Yes, Rach, uh, Rachna, the ECG is that you will have ST segment elevation in all the leads except AVR and you have PR segment depression in all the leads except AVR. Okay, that is what is the ECG changes in case of acute pericarditis. Yes, Rachna, is that clear? Okay, now you take the pericardial effusion. So, normal quantity of the fluid is around 20 to 30 ml and if the quantity of the fluid is more than 30, we use the, more than 50, we use the word it as pericardial effusion. Now, what is the difference between these two? The difference between these two is that when there is gradual accumulation of the fluid in the pericardial space, we call it as the pericardial effusion. Then, what is cardiac tamponade then? It is abrupt accumulation of the fluid. So, please remember, the quantity of the fluid does not decide whether it is pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade. It is the rapidity with which the fluid is accumulating. Okay, right. Then, followed by that, Okay, so now let me quickly recap about the cardiac tamponade. So cardiac tamponade and pericardial effusion, just 5 minutes. 5 minutes, I'll complete this cardiac tamponade and pericardial effusion. So if you take the, right, if you take the normal intrapericardial pressure, normal intrapericardial pressure is around minus 5 to 5 millimeters of mercury. But in cardiac tamponade, the intrapericardial pressure will be more than 15 millimeters of mercury. And because of this, because of increased pericardial pressure, there will be diastolic dysfunction that will result in diastolic collapse of the ventricles. That will result in diastolic collapse of the ventricles. And in cardiac tamponade, Bexoid is very, very important. What is that? There will be raised JVP. That's a very important point. Then next to the raised JVP, how will be the heart sounds? You will have muffled heart sounds and there will be hypotension. So these three includes Bextriad, raised JVP, muffled heart sounds, and as well as the hypotension. And what is the characteristic pulse in cardiac tamponade? That is pulses paradoxes that already I have discussed in the points related to the arterial pulse. And how will be the JVP? JVP will be elevated, right? Kusmal signs will be absent, and Y wave is also absent. And how will be the X wave? the X wave, you have deep X wave in the JVP. Okay, right. Then ECG and as well as 2D echo. So what will the ECG show? ECG shows the electrical alternance. What is electrical alternance? Electrical alternance is nothing but where you have alternating large and small complexes. Hmm? Where you have alternating large and small complexes. That is what is called electrical alternance. And what will the 2D echo show? 2D echo shows that there is diastolic collapse of the ventricles hmm? that there is diastolic collapse of the ventricles that is what the 2d echo will show and then how what what is the treatment the emergency treatment that you will be doing is pericardiocentesis right pericardiocentesis and what is the approach that you should follow while doing pericardiocentesis that should be sub xephoid approach hmm? that should be sub xephoid approach okay right now this is the chest x-ray you come across in pericardial effusion. So what is that appearance called? Money bag appearance or water bag appearance. Okay, money bag appearance or water bag appearance will be there. That is what you come across in pericardial effusion. Then ECG, what did I tell you ECG? That is electrical alternance. What is this electrical alternance? That is you have large and small complexes, large and small complexes. That is what is nothing but your electrical alternance. Okay, so this completes the discussion of your pericardial effusion and as well as the cardiac tamponade. Okay, right. Next, next. So five minutes, your pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade is done. Another five minutes, your constrictive pericarditis will be over. Okay, so constrictive pericard. When will you call it as constrictive pericarditis? To call it as constrictive pericarditis, the pericardium should be thick. How much thick it should be? It should be more than 4 mm thick. Then we use the word constrictive pericarditis. And in these individuals, the pathogenesis will be diastolic dysfunction. 
right pathogenesis will be diastolic dysfunction then you get this characteristic square root sign in constrictive pericarditis and remember this square root sign it is cardiac catheterization pressure changes hmm? cardiac catheterization pressure changes when will you get this dip that you will get the dip during the diastole okay and diastole will not be a complete diastole because pericardium is thick it is not a complete diastole and when will you get this elevation whenever there is movement of the blood from atria to ventricle the ventricular pressure increases and thereby you get this elevation and because the pericardium is thick and calcified it is not allowing the complete relaxation you will get the static pressure okay the pressure will be same further relaxation does not occur further emptying of the blood into the ventricle does not occur so thereby there will be plateau and this will give you the characteristic square root sign okay the clinical features you will have the features of right heart failure and you will have the features of left heart failure what is that so, there will be increased systemic venous pressure so there will be raised jvp tender hepatomegaly pedal edema all that will be there but in conditions with uh, constrictive pericarditis you should know that there is what is called ascites precox what is this ascites precox where the ascites will develop first then followed by the pedal edema normally in congestive heart failure right heart failure pedal edema develops first then followed by that uh, ascites but here it is ulta ascites first then followed by the pedal edema and what will be the features of reduced cardiac output there will be hypotension and there will be fatigue in these individuals and how will be the jvp there will be deep x and y descent and there is also presence of the kusmal sign so kusmal sign will be present and broadband sign what is broadband sign in constrictive pericarditis it is nothing but the tapping apex tapping apex that is what is nothing but your uh, broadband sign and how will be the heart sounds so along with the first and heart second heart sound you also have it an additional heart sound during diastole and that additional heart sound during diastole will be pericardial knock okay that will be the pericardial knock okay then what will be the ecg changes in constrictive pericarditis ecg changes you will have low voltage complexes okay low voltage complexes and pericardial knock is what pericardial knock is a diastolic sound and it's a high pitched sound then ecg will show low voltage complexes and low voltage complexes there are many differential diagnoses pericardial effusion you will get low voltage complexes restrictive cardiomyopathy you will get low voltage complexes constrictive pericarditis also you will get low voltage complexes chest x ray will show you the presence of calcification but which view is more better for identifying the calcification is lateral view will be more better and 2d echo you will see you will observe the presence of the septal bounds with respiration i will show you what is that and ct scan will show you that there is increase in the pericardial thickness and how much should be the pericardial thickness increase that should be more than 4 mm to call it as constrictive pericarditis now yes so this is the chest x ray of the constrictive pericarditis so you can observe the calcification and you can observe very clearly in the lateral view the entire calcification can clearly visible in the lateral view of the chest x ray okay right then we were discussing about the septal bounds what is that septal bounds see during inspiration more blood will be there on the right side of the heart so interventricular septum will be shifted on to the left side that is into lv whereas during expiration more blood will be there on the left side so interventricular septum will be shifted towards the rv side interventricular septum will be shifted towards the rv side during expiration and this is what is called the septal bounds and this is what is called as septal bounds okay right then this is the imaging that is ct where you will observe that pericardial thickness will be more than 4 mm and what is the purpose of mri there are certain mri techniques hmm? there are certain mri techniques which will demonstrate the septal bounds as well and finally how do you treat these patients with the constrictive pericarditis see these individuals they are having the features of your right heart failure right so you need to give right heart failure so you need to give the diuretics okay and the other drugs which are very very important is these patients yes you can give beta blockers and ac inhibitors can be given but if the individual is refractory to medical management then you should do pericardiectomy hmm? then you should do pericardiectomy 
okay so that is about your constrictive pericarditis five minutes constrictive pericarditis is over okay right then then we have the coronary artery disease right yes yadav hello okay so coronary artery disease what is the spectrum you have the spectrum that you have in coronary artery disease is like you have ischemia then you have infarction right ischemia and infarction ischemia you have this like three one is stable angina then you have prince metal angina then unstable angina and infarction based on ecg changes you have non st elevation mi and as well as the st elevation mi so what is the difference between ischemia and infarction how will you identify even though both of them will have chest pain that is cardiac biomarkers okay so cardiac biomarkers if you see in ischemia it will be positive right and whereas sorry i'm very sorry in ischemia the cardiac biomarkers will be negative whereas infarction you will have the positive cardiac biomarkers that is troponin your ckmb they are all elevated in case of infarction and these last three parameters hmm, this last three param this last three they come under what is called acs acute coronary syndrome acute coronary syndrome okay now let me discuss the individual topics now chronic stable angina just 2 minutes okay so chronic stable angina what will be the duration of the chest pain so duration of chest pain will be around 10 to 15 minutes in case of chronic stable angina and this is also also what is called as reversible ischemia levine sign what is this levine sign see the individual will place the fist over the precordium while explaining the chest pain to the doctor that is called levine sign what is the angina equivalent see in patients with diabetic autonomic neuropathy they don't have chest pain because of autonomic neuropathy they will have silent mi so in them you should identify what is the angina equivalent that will be dyspnea and what will be the ecg changes in non uh, chronic stable angina you have non specific stt changes right you have non specific stt changes and what will the thread treadmill test that is your stress test will identify okay the stress test will identify or will diagnose the chronic stable angina or reversible ischemia so treadmill test when you are when the patient is doing treadmill test and when there is development of new onset st segment elevation more than 0.1 millivolt when there is new onset st segment elevation more than 0.1 millivolt and that to down sloping st segment elevation that is suggest you of tmt to be positive and in those individuals who cannot do tmt the stress test that you should do is dobutamine stress test has to be done hmm <coughs> dobutamine stress test has to be done and you should know the contraindications of tmt see patients who had an mi in the la in the previous two days don't do tmt the individual having vt or vf don't do tmt the individual is having aortic dissection right the individual having aortic dissection don't do tmt okay then what is the drug of choice in case of chronic stable angina drug of choice for chronic stable angina will be beta blockers then what are the other drugs that we give in chronic stable angina for pain for chest pain we give nitrates and the other drugs that we give is antiplatelets either aspirin or clopidogrel is given not dual antiplatelet single antiplatelet is given aspirin or clopidogrel okay yes vignesh you can use this even for neat pg as well because neat pg and fmg syllabus is the same right and next is the statins right next is the statins okay so this is about your chronic stable angina which is nothing but uh, reversible ischemia then you should know what is the role of imaging in coronary artery disease this is another very very important question thallium 201 or technetium 99 scan why is it useful for it is useful for myocardial perfusion imaging right it is useful for myocardial perfusion imaging okay then what is the purpose of doing the pet scan the purpose of doing pet scan is mainly to differentiate 
scar tissue from the stunned myocardium. What is that? That is hibernating myocardium. So to differentiate hibernating myocardium from scar tissue, we use this PET scan. What is the purpose of doing this electron beam CT scan? The purpose of doing electron beam CT scan is mainly to quantify coronary artery calcification. Right, mainly to quantify coronary artery calcification, we need to do electron beam CT scan. Then what is the purpose of doing this gadolinium enhanced MRI? The purpose of doing this gadolinium enhanced MRI is, it's a most sensitive test, test to detect and quantify the extent of infarction. Right, to quantify the extent of infarction. Okay, so that is the purpose of doing the gadolinium enhanced MRI. So that is about your chronic stable angina or reversible ischemia and role of imaging in coronary artery disease. Okay? Yes, I'll be sending you this PDF. Don't worry at all. Either I'll be sending you on the Unacademy uh, Telegram channel or I'll be sending on my Telegram channel that is Medicine Made Easy by Dr. Rajesh Guba. Okay, don't worry about the PDF at all. Definitely I'll send it. Then coming to another important form of coronary artery disease that is Prince Metal Angina. So Prince Metal Angina, the another name for it is, it is also called as vasospastic angina okay vasospastic angina okay or it is also called variant angina hmm? it is also called variant angina okay now if you take this chest pain these individuals will also have chest pain and what is the time at which you will be having chest time at which you will be having the chest pain in case of prince metal angina is the chest pain will be there between midnight and 8 a.m. Right between midnight and 8 a.m. That is the time when you will be having the chest pain in patients with the Prince Metal Angina. Most common vessel. So basically what will happen here? There will be transient coronary vasospasm. The most common vessel. Transient coronary vasospasm will be right coronary artery. And what will be the ECG changes in Prince Metal Angina? You will be having ST segment elevation exactly during the time of chest pain hmm? exactly during the time of chest pain you have the ST segment elevation okay and drug of choice will be nitrates that will cause coronary artery vasodilatation then followed by that the other important drug that is calcium channel blockers so the other drugs that will be calcium channel blockers and we also have a rho kinase inhibitor and what is that rho kinase inhibitor which is used in the treatment of prince metal angina that will be fasciodil okay that will be fasciodil okay so this is about your prince metal angina or the vasospastic angina and whenever there is vasospasm right you know how much percentage of the vessel will be blocked more than 75 percentage of the vessel will be blocked and in these patients with the prince metal angina you should not give the aspirin aspirin should not be given aspirin is not recommended okay very very important point no aspirin in patients with the Prince metal angina because this aspirin it can cause the vasospasm by altering the levels of the process cycle because the aspirin can change the synthesis of the process cycle levels and they can cause vasospasm so aspirin should not be given in these individuals okay right then coming to the acute coronary syndrome in acute coronary syndrome what did i tell you three comp three components are there unstable angina non-st elevation mi and st elevation mi so to call it as unstable angina, the individual will have pain at rest. Okay, whereas stable angina, the pain will be there on exertion. Whereas here the pain at rest and the pain gradually increases. Right, gradually it increases. It is a progressive pain. Okay, right. And in these patients with unstable angina, you should remember one important syndrome called Wellen syndrome. What is this Wellen syndrome? And in this Wellen syndrome, it is suggestive of pro critical proximal left anterior descending artery occlusion. Right? Okay, that is what is called Wellens syndrome. Critical proximal LED occlusion. Then how will you identify Wellens? How will you identify Wellens is by the ECG. So you have Wellens type 1 and type 2. So in type 1, you have deep T wave inversion. And how much will be the deep T wave inversion? More than 2 mm T wave inversion will be there. 
more than 2 mm deep T wave inversion will be there and that too in the precordial leads V2 and V3. Whereas type 2 valence syndrome you will have biphasic T wave inversion. Right, you have biphasic T wave inversion in type 2 valence syndrome. Okay, so what is the point suggest you of valence that tells you that there is critical proximal left anterior descending artery occlusion. Then coming to NSTEMI. So NSTEMI and unstable angina, the treatment is same. So in these patients also, they will have angina, ST segment will be depressed, troponin will be elevated in case of NSTEMI. And in these two patients, the treatment is same. What is the treatment is same? We give DAPT, dual antiplatelet therapy, that is aspirin or clopidogrel. Along with that, we give statins, atorvastatin. Along with this, you will be giving anticoagulant, that is low molecular weight heparin should be given. Or unfractionated heparin also can be given. Okay, So anticoagulants like low molecular weight heparin should be given in these individuals. right? And other drugs that can be given is glycoprotein 2B 3A inhibitors. What is that glycoprotein 2B 3A inhibitors? The glycoprotein 2B 3A inhibitors are nothing but your tirofiban, right? Tirofiban that will be your glycoprotein 2B 3A inhibitor. Okay, right. Then so after doing this management, if the individual is stabilized. Then you do coronary angiogram. If coronary angiogram shows more than 70 percentage blockade, then you place a stent. Otherwise, not required. So that is about unstable angina and instemi. So what is the difference then in unstable angina? The cardiac biomarkers will be negative. Hmm? The cardiac biomarkers will be negative in case of unstable angina, but it will be positive in case of the non-ST elevation. M. That is the difference between these two, right? Okay. Now, then we will move on to the next important clinical spectrum that is the STEMI that is ST elevation MI. So ST elevation MI as the word itself tells you ST segment should be elevated more than 2 mm in chest leads more than 1 mm in the limb leads and that too it should be in two contiguous leads it should be in two contiguous leads okay chest pain if you take the duration of the chest pain that can be there more than 30 minutes also and what is the earliest ECG change the earliest ECG change will be broad tall T wave that will be the earliest ECG change then followed by that there will be ST segment elevation then other changes will be there 2D echo will show you that there is hypokinesia of hmm, there is a hypokinesia of the affected ventricle right there will be hypokinesia of the affected ventricle okay that is what you will have in the 2d okay then coronary angiogram what it will show you coronary angiogram it will show you the presence of thrombus cardiac biomarkers they will be elevated right cardiac biomarkers they will be elevated okay just one minute Right, next. Then, followed by that, you should know about the ECG changes. So, as just now I have said you, the ECG changes, what is the earliest ECG change? That is broad, tall T wave. Then, followed by that, ST segment elevation. Followed by that, there will be, hmm? yeah, not hyperkinesia, hypokinesia will be there, rao. Hmm? Hypokinesia will be there, not hyperkinesia. Okay. Then followed by that, there will be disappearance of the R wave. Followed by that, you have the T wave being inverted. Followed by that, you have the appearance of the Q wave. Okay. So these will be the ECG changes in patients with the uh, ST elevation MI. Then cardiac biomarkers are very, very important. So what is the first cardiac biomarker to raise? The first cardiac biomarker to raise is heart fatty acid binding protein. The first cardiac biomarker to raise is what? Heart fatty acid binding protein. And what is the new cardiac biomarker? The new cardiac biomarker will be the copeptin. And even your heart fatty acid binding protein is also new cardiac biomarker. And after this heart fatty acid binding protein, the other biomarker that will be elevated is myoglobin, but it is non-specific. 
but it is non specific then what is the marker of reinfarction marker of reinfarction is the serial rise of the troponin levels so if you take the troponin i or troponin t if you do the quantification 20% troponin should be elevated compared to the previous value that is a marker of reinfarction okay reinfarction is best diagnosed by 20% increase over baseline troponin t value and if the question is asked what is the reinfarction how can you assess the reinfarction after 72 hours that can be by your ckmb levels and if you take the ldh pattern it's a flipped pattern what is that flipped pattern that is normally ldh is predominant form in serum and ldh1 is in the heart so the pattern that you will get in case of the st elevation mi that will be the flipped pattern okay so this is about your cardiac biomarkers okay right then coming to the treatment in patients with the st elevation mi so if the question is asked what is the first line treatment in st elevation mi that will be aspirin hmm, that will be aspirin so what are the loading doses that you will be giving in semi aspirin then clopidogrel so either clopidogrel or you can give even ticagrelor okay even ticagrelor can be given the other one is atorvastatin so these are the loading doses that we give then what is the best revascularization method in patients with st elevation mi the best revascularization method is percutaneous coronary intervention right and thrombolysis you have many thrombolytic agents so thrombolysis should be done within 12 hours after 12 hours don't do thrombolysis it will be of no use right and what is the best thrombolytic agent best thrombolytic agent will be tenecteplase <laughs> okay so you have alteplase reticulase tenecteplase and streptokinase the best will be tenecteplase maximum revascularization can be achieved by tenecteplase when will you do cabg when there is a triple vessel disease do cabg and if there is proximal left main coronary artery stenosis hmm? proximal left main coronary artery stenosis then you do cabg the, if there is two vessel disease with reduced ejection fraction two vessel disease with reduced ejection fraction then also you do cabg okay so this is about the indications for doing cabg then finally what are the complications of mi so complications of mi you have structural complications and you have electrical complications what will be the structural complications like vsd mr or even there can be cardiac rupture then what will be the electrical complications that can be vt or vf they are very common within 48 hours of development of mi then there can be even av block causing bradyarrhythmias this av block causing bradyarrhythmias are very common in inferior wall mi right very common in inferior wall mi and posterior wall mi so this will be the complications but you should remember the late complication what is that late complication that is dressler syndrome what is this dressler syndrome post myocardial infarction pericarditis right post myocardial infarction pericarditis so this will appear after right after weeks to months after development of mi hmm? it will appear after weeks to months after development of mi that is called dressler syndrome post myocardial infarction pericarditis where the patient will present with chest pain and esr will be elevated then how do you treat this dressler syndrome you increase the dose of aspirin or you give colchicine or you give corticosteroids that will be the treatment for your dressler syndrome okay right so we are done with the coronary artery disease okay right the next one important topic will be the rheumatic fever so rheumatic fever is what so it is antibody which is formed against group a beta hemolytic streptococci right which component of group a beta hemolytic streptococci it is formed against m protein hmm? the our immune system will form antibody against m protein of group a beta hemolytic streptococci this particular antibody will come and attack n acetyl glucosamine will come and attack n acetyl glucosamine which is present within the joints which is present within the heart which is present within the skin which is present within the cns that is what is your rheumatic fever
okay so what is important in rheumatic fever that is criteria so five minutes i'll finish the rheumatic fever so criteria is modified jones criteria so according to this modified jones criteria we classify the population into low risk and as well as high risk okay so now in low risk population how many joints have to be affected in low risk population please remember it should be polyarthritis only right polyarthritis only that is a major criteria whereas in moderate to high risk population polyarthritis is not required even monoarthritis is there that can be taken as the major criteria right either mono or monoarthritis or even if there is polyarthralgia even if there is polyarthralgia that is also sufficient Hmm, that is also sufficient okay right the remaining all same in high risk and low risk the remaining all same there will be carditis subcutaneous nodules erythema marginatum and sedenam scoria everything will be same but the only difference is regarding the joint in the major criteria whereas you take the minor criteria and what is the treatment for your sedenam scoria is a very important question see if it is a mild sedenam scoria just provide calm environment don't give any drug but if it is like moderate forms of scoria you have to give carbamazepine right then you have to give carbamazepine or you should give valproic acid that is very much preferred over the haloperidol and if it is like severe or refractory cases of rheumatic uh, rheumatic chorea if it is severe or uh, refractory cases of rheumatic chorea then you should give steroids right then you should give steroids okay then so that was about your major criteria then coming to the minor criteria okay minor criteria so minor criteria also again we divide it into low risk population high risk population so you take the joint involvement in low risk population definitely it should be polyarthralgia only whereas in moderate and high risk even monoarthralgia is there okay even monoarthralgia is there we take it as the minor criteria fever it should be more than 38.5 degree centigrade here also same and you take the esr esr in low risk population it should be more than 60 mm in first hour okay it should be more than 60 mm in first hour whereas in moderate to high risk population the esr it should be more than 30 mm in the first hour and what will happen to the pr interval the pr interval will be prolonged so this will be the minor criteria then what is the diagnostic criteria diagnostic criteria is two major or one major plus two minor manifestations are required and along with that what should be there along with this there should be features suggestive of elevated aso titer hmm? there should be evidence of elevated aso titer then important image based question right so usually the deformities are very rare in rheumatic fever in rheumatic fever the deformities are very rare right and it is a type of non erosive arthropathy jacobs arthropathy is what it is a form of non erosive arthropathy that is what is your jacobs arthropathy and what will happen here it is second to fifth fingers right second to fifth fingers there will be ulnar deviation right there will be ulnar deviation this is what is called as jacobs arthropathy and this will be a very important image based question so what is the drug of choice for your arthritis we give high dose salicylates aspirin we give okay and if the patient is allergic to aspirin we give this naloxone okay right or naproxen i'm sorry not naloxen naproxen okay i'm very sorry okay naproxen we give right and then prophylaxis prophylaxis what do we give we give injection benzathine penicillin this benzathine penicillin we give 1.2 million units if the weight of the individual is more than 27 kg and uh, you should give deep im injection benzathine penicillin deep im 1.2 million units okay and if the individual weight is less than 27 kg you should give half of it that is 0.6 million units that is 6 lakhs units you should give and it is benzathine penicillin and for how long you give this uh, prophylaxis is very important if the patient is not having carditis then you should give for 5 years after the last attack or 21 years of age whichever is longer 
but if the patient is having carditis but there is no residual valvular disease then you give 10 years after the last attack or 21 years of age or up to 21 years of age whichever is longer and if the patient is having persistent valvular heart disease that is the point when you should give 10 years after the last attack or 40 or up to 40 years of age okay so whichever is longer so that is the duration of your prophylaxis this table is very very important you should definitely know about this table okay so this finishes your rheumatic fever so five minutes rheumatic fever is over right then quickly let me discuss about the valvular heart diseases so valvular heart disease like mitral stenosis when will you call mitral stenosis when the valve area is less than 2 mm we call it as mitral stenosis that is mitral valve area normal valve area is 4 to 6 centimeter square when the mitral valve area is less than 2 mm we use the word mitral stenosis and when will you get this okay and what is the most common cause of mitral stenosis most common cause of mitral stenosis will be rheumatic heart disease then you take the heart sounds in mitral stenosis the first heart sound it will be loud but if it is calcified ms if it is calcified ms then you will have soft s1 okay and next important thing is if ms is associated with atrial fibrillation then you will have variable s1 then you will have variable s1 and between s1 and s2 is what it's a systolic sound it is a systolic area nothing will be there nothing is heard and in s2 p2 will be loud when do you have p2 will be loud when the individual develops pulmonary hypertension that is the point when the p2 will be loud okay then in case of the diastole there are three additional sounds so one additional sound will be opening snap one additional sound will be opening snap which is being heard in the early part of the diastole the another important additional sound will be mid diastolic murmur and another important additional sound will be the pre systolic accentuation okay and this pre systolic accentuation is due to forcible left atrial contraction right it is due to forcible left atrial contraction okay then opening snap is due to what that is due to opening opening of the mitral valve forcibly opening of the mitral valve forcibly that will result in the opening snap okay so these are the uh, heart sounds that you very important in mitral stenosis coming to the complications in mitral stenosis atrial fibrillation why is that atrial fibrillation there is left atrial enlargement or there will be left atrial hypertrophy this hypertrophy left atrium will be arrhythmogenic where the individual will develop atrial fibrillation then this enlarged left atrium can compress the esophagus because of which there will be difficulty in swallowing and this enlarged left atrium can also compress the airway thereby the individual will have wheez then what is this ortner syndrome see this enlarged left atrium will cause compression of recurrent laryngeal nerve Hmm, this enlarged left atrium can cause compression of recurrent laryngeal nerve and this is what is called ortner syndrome and in this ortner syndrome there will be development of the hoarseness of voice right there will be development of the hoarseness of voice okay then coming to the images images are very important in mitral stenosis so in ecg what is the change that you will have so you will have p mitral okay so the p wave it will be of m shape that is called p mitral and the duration of the p wave right the duration of the p wave will be more than 120 milliseconds that will be the ecg change in mitral stenosis then the another important which is uh, very important in the mitral stenosis is the x ray so x ray you will have straightening of the left heart border why is that you have straightening of the left heart border that is due to left atrial enlargement and due to left atrial enlargement not only straightening of the left heart border if you see you have this characteristic double density sign okay you have this characteristic double density sign why is this double density sign again due to left atrial enlargement okay so this is about your the chest x-ray in patients with mitral stenosis then 2d echo is another important thing in mitral stenosis you get this classical hockey stick appearance so this is what is your hockey stick and why do you get this hockey stick that is due to restricted mitral valve leaflet movement 
okay so that is due to restricted mitral valve leaflet movement you get this the hockey stick appearance then now quick question where do you get hockey stick appearance on the ecg in which condition you will have hockey stick appearance on the ecg any one of you hockey stick appearance in the ecg so hockey stick appearance in the ecg you will have this in patients with the digoxin effect not digoxin toxicity digoxin effect in digoxin effect you will have this hockey stick appearance okay then lastly you should know which procedure is being done for patients with mitral stenosis so it is your pbmv percutaneous mitral valve balloon valvotomy percutaneous mitral valve balloon valvotomy that is the procedure that we do in, in patients with severe mitral stenosis who are being symptomatic okay then now what is the name of the balloon name of the balloon is also a question and the name of the balloon is the ino balloon hmm? the name of the balloon is ino balloon so that is about your mitral stenosis and you should know what are the contraindications of the pbmv contraindications of pbmv is calcified mitral stenosis don't do pbmv if there is left atrial thrombus don't do pbmv right and if ms associated with moderate to severe mr don't do pbmv so in all these contraindications what you have to do is you have to do mitral valve replacement you have to do mitral valve replacement okay so that is about your ms mitral stenosis now coming to mr mitral regurgitation so mitral regurgitation is what it is a leakage of the blood from left ventricle to the left atrium so you have primary and secondary mr primary mr where the pathology is in the valve secondary mr some other causes okay what are the causes for primary mr mitral valve prolapse degenerative conditions rheumatic heart disease endocarditis mitral annular calcification and rupture of the caudate tendon you take the secondary mr secondary mr it occurs mainly secondary to coronary artery disease which particular coronary artery disease that is the inferior wall mi then cardiomyopathies and papillary muscle dysfunction now you should know important point about this mitral valve prolapse so when will you call mitral valve prolapse right that means like mitral valves how much they have to prolapse into left atrium so if you see this the prolapse it should be more than 2 mm okay the prolapse of the mitral valve into the left atrium should be more than 2 mm that is the point when okay that is what we call it as the mitral valve prolapse okay right then in mitral regurgitation what will be the important auscultatory points the important auscultatory points s1 will be soft and you have this pan systolic murmur okay and you have wide split s2 because of early a2 then you will have loud p2 that is because of development of pulmonary hypertension so and you can also have mid diastolic murmur in case of acute rheumatic fever and that is called carycombs murmur so this will be the auscultation in patients with the mitral regurgitation okay right and lastly let me take up the discussion about the aortic stenosis this is the last i'll wind up this session after this so aortic stenosis what is the most common cause of aortic stenosis in children that will be bicuspid aortic valve congenital what is the most common cause of aortic stenosis in adults that is sclerotic aortic valve right that is sclerotic aortic valve okay then what are the symptoms of the aortic stenosis so just remember the mnemonic sad just remember the mnemonic sad that is syncopal attack angina and dyspnea syncopal attack angina and dyspnea so these are the three important symptoms of the aortic stenosis syncopal attack angina and dyspnea then in aortic stenosis like what will be the characteristic pulse that is pulses parvus et tardis this already we have discussed and what will be the pulse pressure narrow pulse pressure why is that because of decreased systolic blood pressure there will be narrow pulse pressure and how will be the a2 a2 will be soft or absent a2 and what is the treatment that what is a murmur it is ejection systolic murmur okay it's a harsh ejection systolic murmur then you should know like uh, the treatment if the individual is symptomatic you need to do surgical replacement of the valve okay so either we do aortic valve replacement completely 
or the other option is the tower what is tower transcatheter aortic valve replacement transcatheter aortic valve replacement that is what is called as the tower okay so this is about the all the topics related to your cardiology right so with this i'll wind up this session so we are done with the uh, endocrinology and we are done with the cardiology so tomorrow i will discuss nephrology and then connective tissue disorders nephrology connective tissue disorders and if time permits even i will take up even pulmonology as well okay so with this i'll wind up the today's session and you can follow me on my instagram handle and my instagram handle is rajesh gubba right you will get all the notifications related to the general medicine and this is my telegram channel medicine made easy by dr rajesh gubba so here i'll be sending you the pdf now right here i'll be sending you the pdf now okay yeah uh, timing same timing 6 pm tomorrow okay 6 pm tomorrow i'll be doing the uh, connective tissue disorders then nephrology then time permits pulmonology okay right so thank you very much see you tomorrow again at 6 pm i hope you have enjoyed the session because it was like quick recap of all the topics related to general medicine of the respective chapters and if you couldn't find the link okay or otherwise you people text me on my whatsapp number this is my whatsapp number i will send you the channel link right so this is my whatsapp number so just please send me your text message i will send you the link of my uh, telegram channel okay right so thank you very much see you tomorrow again at 6 pm